My name is uh, Tim Dempsey. I grew up in Potsdam, New York. I graduated from Potsdam High School in 1983. Um, and welcome to the Bodacious Bears. Uh, I came across this idea after watching the uh, 30 for 30 special on The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. Uh, I was really taken back by that and then thought, why couldn't this be done for the uh, Potsdam Bears and, and growing up here and this phenomenal success they had. Uh, it was Jordan-esque or Patriot-esque, Brady-esque, whatever you want to use. You know, the system is not set up for uh, the kind of success they had. Um, no one is supposed to be that dominant. And it really made uh, growing up in Potsdam fun. Most of my friends would go uh, Friday night or to a Clarkson hockey game and then Saturday night go watch the Bears. For all we knew, we were living in midtown Manhattan. Uh, it was all the sports we needed, very entertaining and very positive. I never missed a game. It was just a, a good way to get through the winter and, uh, and and see just great basketball. I mean, we all, I, we all wanted to dunk like Derek, dribble and shoot like Eddie, and uh, move like the spoon and be as cool as Mo Woods. Growing up in Potsdam, which is uh, you know not the best weather or the best geographic location, it was astonishing that they could pull off this this stunt. In Potsdam, 29 days a year, it's below zero. 44% of the days are below freezing, and uh, they receive 83 inches of snow a year. So not exactly a hotbed for recruiting basketball players, but uh, Jerry Welsh and his team were able to do it. It was interesting as we looked into more research, just what was going on in Potsdam during that period. Um, believe it or not, Potsdam really had it going on during the 80s, and like uh, looking at women's hockey during that time, the uh, wrestling team and the swimming team were naturally ranked as well as the basketball team. Again, as you get into this, you realize it wasn't uh, a two or three person shop. It was a whole university. It was very innovative. I mean, you, you, they did things that uh, they pushed the envelope. I mean, this is an area where I think the Stanley Cup visits more than the governor. So it's not an area where basketball is even thought of. Everyone I've spoken to or sort of broached the idea on has been very excited about it. It's given me great joy. And I know everyone um, sort of remember when and they come up with different stories. And uh, and we're all getting older. And it's, so it's important to, um, to capture this and leave it on YouTube forever and, um, and try to encapsulate this time. And just thanking them to acknowledge them for what they did. I'm not sure that has been done enough. And as they get older and I get older, I guess this, this, this stuff becomes more important. Uh, why not Let's give us a shot? And it's turned out better than I ever imagined. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Hello, my name is Tim Welsh. Whether you have been a lifelong fan and follower of Potsdam Bears basketball, or you are completely new to our story, I'm very pleased to welcome you and thank you for your interest. I was born and raised in a far upstate region of New York, typically referred to by local residents as the North Country. Throughout my formative years, I was continuously around players and staff at Potsdam State's basketball program. Looking back at those experiences, it's no surprise my own career was tremendously influenced and then evolved as a direct result of the incredible tradition and leadership connected to all aspects of the Potsdam Bear basketball program. Everything that occurred, as many others have told us over the years, will never happen again. Not in Potsdam, nor anywhere else. My personal and daily perspectives throughout all of this were quite unique. My father, head coach Jerry Welsh, was essentially the commander or the general of the program. He guided all events on and off the basketball court during this historic period of Potsdam State Athletics. You're about to hear personal stories and see original footage which will share incredible memories and highlights from the epic era of Potsdam Bears basketball. All of the accolades, records, and achievements are truly remarkable. 
They stand on their own as a reflection of one of the most dominant teams in basketball history. Over the past 35 years since I left Potsdam, I've had several experience coaching at the Division I level and broadcasting games regularly for ESPN. My memories of being at Potsdam State as a part of the Bears basketball program and understanding how and why all was accomplished remain my fondest and proudest times to recall. Once again, we thank you for your time and interest in this project. We hope you enjoy the story of the Bodacious Bears. Thank you, Dad. WPDM, AM and FM in Potsdam, New York, operating on an AM frequency of 1,470 kilocycles and an FM frequency of 99.3 megacycles. We welcome you to another day in the best in Seaway Valley radio entertainment and information, including world, national, and local news, music to suit your taste, and comprehensive sports coverage. Bodacious can be really um, bodacious is like either uh, something that is outstanding, outstanding, outstanding like a mi- whoa, or it's also like uh, like yeah. bodacious is a weird happening, like mm-hmm. extraordinary mm-hmm. happening, yeah. some kind. It of- is an extreme version of on the extreme periphery of outstanding, somewhere between excellent and savory, and almost like supernatural, almost if it wants to be. Or there's a mystical be. quality as there well. There can have a mystical element. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. And- What if I told you a small town with humble beginnings and a population of just under 15,000 people was home to one of the most dominant and unlikely dynasties in sports history? Located in northern New York, the village of Potsdam is tucked between the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains and the Canadian border. The dynasty grew and flourished in the 1980s at a time where Dr. J and Magic Johnson headlined the NBA and the Showtime Lakers led a dominant fast break against the entire league. Michael Jordan's legendary career was just taking off. Oh, what a play! Michael Jordan took it down! Coach Jim Valvano led the NC State Wolfpack to a national championship. They won it! The marching band took the field during the final moments of the infamous 1982 Stanford-Cal football game. The Bears have won! 
United States Olympic Committee voted to boycott the Summer Olympic Games in Moscow. On the global stage, where politics and sports intersect, some of the most important moments in Olympic history also took place during this time. Neither the American people nor I will support sending an Olympic team to Moscow. Within a short drive from Potsdam, another small village in upstate New York captured the dramatic focus of the world's attention when Lake Placid hosted the 1980 Winter Olympics. Eric Haydn won five gold medals and Team USA pulled off the miracle on ice against the Soviets. These moments all define the era and they continue to stand the test of time in the history books. Compared to all of these incredible feats, how could a small school in the middle of nowhere grab the imagination of sports fans everywhere? It could be argued the Potsdam State Bears had levels of massive success similar to those iconic moments, players and teams of the 80s. Their story also includes a level of fantasy and imagination which shares a resemblance to the 1980 Miracle on Ice. A wild and screaming crowd at the NCAA Division III National Championship Basketball Game here on ESPN. I'm Kevin Slayton alongside John Andres. John, I'll tell you what, if the game's anything like the crowd here, it's going to be a wild one this evening. Super game coming up, I know it. This is absolutely the most exciting scene I've seen this year, and I'm just delighted to be here with you, Kevin. It's going to be a great one. The Bears of Potsdam State after the opening tip. The ball belongs to Potsdam State. The Potsdam Bears went against the odds to become one of the most dominant basketball teams in the country. Their amazing story starts in Potsdam, New York. Historical records detail the town of Potsdam was incorporated February 21st, 1806. The nucleus of settlement within the present village was at the falls of the Racket River. The early pioneer farmers lived in clearings in the surrounding area. I'm a northern New York boy to start from. I came to Potsdam in 1950 and I graduated from Potsdam in 1954. At that time, the region was seeing massive economic support and investment as part of the infrastructure plans of President Dwight Eisenhower. This included the development of the magnificent St. Lawrence Seaway. Right now, the greatest concentration of heavy machinery ever assembled, over 3,000 pieces of equipment, are at work on one of the greatest projects in the history of mankind. I'm Walter Cronkite with a report on the St. Lawrence Seaway and Power Project. It was in 1954, only after long years of domestic and international discussion, that Canada and the United States agreed to begin the gigantic task, that of reshaping a continent, creating an eighth sea, and at the same time, harnessing the tremendous hydroelectric power potential of this mighty river opening new trade routes, creating new avenues of achievement. This is the product of a kind of international cooperation that may well set the example for the whole world. Over the past century, the region's growth has been directly related to its foundation as a center for agricultural, industrial, and educational expertise. Potsdam is such a small area. It was growing in numbers as the campus spread out, as the college got bigger. There are four significant universities on Route 11, all located within about 10 minutes of one another. At that time, you know, you had, you had Clarkson, St. Lawrence, Potsdam, Kansas. There was a lot of college kids up there, so it was a, it was a great place to go to college. Uh, the education was outstanding, uh, and I, I like the this, this small school atmosphere. Each of the four schools attract a unique blend of students who contribute greatly to the diverse culture and economics of the area. You know, I think about that often now that, you know, you, I'm 51 years old now, and I think back to, you know, growing up, how unique that entire situation was. Potsdam is a dichotomy. You've got, it's a, a rural area, beautiful scenic place, but then you have, you have Potsdam, you have Canton, you have St. Lawrence University, very well thought of, Clarkson, right? World renowned technology and business school. Mm -hmm. And they're all right there within 10 miles of each other. As beautiful as it truly is, the geographic location and climate could be viewed as a barrier to potential academic and athletic recruits. And I can say this because I grew up there. It is, it is, there's no easy way to get there. You're in the middle of nowhere. I kid people, I say, I could, I could live in a house that wasn't attached to another one. <laughs> uh, originally, I was born in Florida. 
So I'll be the first to admit that uh, I didn't really think there was anything north of Syracuse uh, until I got up here. Um, but this will be my 10th year in the North Country. Um, and so it's been an incredible journey for me. So you got up there and yeah, it was in the middle of nowhere and uh, sometimes pretty darn cold. And <laughs> sometimes. And I, I Those sometimes were from November to March. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, sometimes. Uh, it was a, a, a culture shock to me. You know what I mean? Uh, because, you know, honestly speaking, when the winter came, the snow was way up there. But the thing about that was the snow was phenomenal. You know, uh, I remember Mo and I we used to meet to go to classes and we'd literally have to, you know, they had ropes. Oh yeah, they had ropes to pull you up, you know, go through the classes and to get to where we had to go, you know. Uh, it was unbelievable. I've never seen so much snow. It's a big difference, man. I mean, it was real cold up there. And uh, I mean, we talking below zero weather. It was real cold. I can remember coming back from trips. You go down the night before to sleep, but you didn't stay the night after. So I remember some of those trips, a number of them, and snowstorms, which were, in fact, one or two times we didn't even make it through. But so that's unique to northern New York to get through the snow belt. One ride we had, we had a blizzard. And we had to pull over. And Coach was still trying to drive. It was blizzard. We were all in the and we was all in the college van. And Coach, we couldn't go no further. Coach was still he was still trying to drive. And I'm I'm in the front seat and I'm looking out the windows and I'm trying to tell Coach. I'm saying, Coach, listen, you gotta stay in the middle of the road. You gotta stay in the middle of the road. And he was driving. He said, I can see, I can see. I said, No, you can't. And so I was helping him steer the steer the van. And so we ended up stopping at a hotel and we spent the night. That was one of the, that was one of the craziest moments. We embrace where we are. We love our location. We talk about our location as positive, you know. And you know, we talk about our location as being somewhere where you're going to come and have a new experience. You know, um, Austin is a unique place, and we love our area. We love our location, and. We talk about the winners and we talk about you know, what the, the challenges may be, but we don't, we don't run from it, we don't hide from it. We talk about who we are and what we're about and, and what you're here for. Um, you can come to Boston, you're going to get a fantastic education in a great place, a unique place in the country with the Adirondack Mountains. And you're going to play in a fantastic facility for a fantastic program. The region's geographic location and climate were key factors in the popularity of hockey. Clarkson and St. Lawrence have Division I hockey programs with deep traditions in the North Country. On a weekly basis, fans travel near and far, packing the arenas for these games. The community in, in Potsdam, keep in mind that uh, the North Country had uh, really, really good hockey. Uh, both St. Lawrence and Clarkson had good hockey. Yeah, that was cool. We, uh, of course, got to know a lot of Clarkson hockey players uh, and would go to games. Especially in my later years, they they were outstanding. They played the, actually for the national championship uh, in my senior year. We went up to Lake Placid to watch that. The high school teams were always great hockey schools, and and everybody in the winter time, everybody was hockey, hockey crazy. Well, I've seen a Red Raiders hockey team in Utica today battling Pittsburgh of Section Five for the New York State Public High School Athletic Association Division One title. The coach Tim Long's team won their second state championship in the last three years. Bob Offeld made the trip down Route 12 and has the story. Mike LaPointe would score the game winner early in the third on the breakaway to give Messina a 6-3 win and their second state title in three years. And there you see it, Messina with a 6-3 win over Pittsburgh, certainly building a dynasty in state hockey. Canton State School also had a dominant hockey program. They won 15 NJCAA National Championships from 1973 to 2000 under the direction of Terry Mark. Through the years, those connections from the region to the hockey world have included dozens of individuals who have gone on to have success at the highest level, including the likes of Bill Torrey, Craig Conroy, Jeff Molson, Greg Carvel, Derek Lalone, Zach Bogosian, Joe Marsh, and Jordan Greenway. Greenway, a native of Potsdam and Canton, became the first African-American player to compete for the U.S. men's hockey team in the Olympics. Where I come from? Everyone plays hockey, you know, there's a rink everywhere you go in every town. My mom, when we were younger, always told us, you know, that, you know, we were going to be, you know, a little bit different than most people. To be honest, him nor I even knew he was breaking a color barrier. 
He also became the first player in hockey history to play in the Olympics, the NCAA Ice Hockey Tournament, and the Stanley Cup playoffs all in the same season. The other big sport on that campus was wrestling, and uh, going to those wrestling meets were uh, something that we looked forward to. We, we were friends with each other, practiced in the same facility, so saw each other all the time. And there were some, some very good wrestlers that Coach Neil Johnson had back in those days. Coach Johnson was able to pioneer the Potsdam State Wrestling Program, which steadily ascended the SUNYAC ranks. I was a wrestling coach and developed a pretty strong program. We won the conference one year and had, a, had an outstanding team for four or five years. And the college was really growing then. I realized that throughout fall the morning was around. This building was just being built, the library was just being built. It's just timing-wise, it was perfect for us. From the founding of Potsdam State University, the school had a deep history built into its bloodline. I've been going to Potsdam basketball games since I would say uh, 1957, 58, something like that. I remember the, the days when, when the Potsdam program was building to a crescendo of, of great success. It started with a lot of significant people. Since the four regional colleges each have varying focuses across the wide spectrum of higher education, talented individuals from many different industries are attracted to the North Country. Huge names in, in North Country history, huge names in Potsdam history, Dr. Satterley and Dr. Crum and Charlie Leahy and Joe Hennessy and and Dr. Maxey and Dr. Molnar, just so many people who were uh, instrumental in, in the success of Potsdam and Potsdam State. It was a team of coaches, and we had three teams that were all naturally ranked at the same time in those days. And that's what I think about it. It wasn't everybody being, separate, being selfish. We worked as a gather, together and uh, shared where people were to go recruit and so forth. So that was the big thing. We were a team. We had lots of people come to campus and my view was this, the more people you can get there, the better off we're going to be because you'd have to see the quality of the campus from many perspectives uh, to help people understand that just because it was a public, primarily four-year college, undergraduate college primarily, uh, that uh, it, it could have amazing quality. So I thought, well, why don't we help people understand that you get the quality of the, of the finest private colleges in New York State, but at the price of a public college. And so my view is to try to help people understand all of the, the wealth of sound academic programs. Charles Leahy, a graduate of St. Lawrence and Syracuse Universities, was a professor of history at Potsdam State. He was Potsdam's town historian and was nationally recognized for his leadership in educational reform. In his book from 1966, The Potsdam Tradition, Leahy writes, A cultural terrain lay beneath this educational phenomenon and provided the inner dynamisms for the establishment of the school. How these tests were met depended not only upon the times, but upon the character of the people in the town and on the board of trustees. Even though life in Potsdam was hard and uncertain, the urge for progress prompted an early movement for education. I had pretty early decided that I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. Uh, I kind of, kind of always liked school. Um, and so that, that fit right in with, uh, with Potsdam. You know, for me, uh, I did want to be a teacher. And so at that time, they had a great school of education. There was no question it was. Yes. And everybody that graduated was getting a job. The origins of Potsdam State University are historic. Founded in 1816, it is among the 50 oldest colleges in the United States. It is also home to an historic teacher's education program, which dates back more than 200 years to the college's founding, and also home of the esteemed Crane School of Music, which was the first music education program in the country. In fact, Crane staff and students provided the music for the Lake Placid Olympics in 1980. The State University of New York was present, most visibly with young musicians from the Crane School of Music at Potsdam, providing ceremonial music throughout the games. There was a lot of social activity. A number of outstanding concerts were held of, of 
uh, bands that we look at now and, uh, you know, out at Boston get it because they, they were just up and coming at the time. It, it was a, yeah, a pretty exciting time to be, especially in the, being in a rock band because it was a lot of, a lot of music going on in town. Um, there could be live music in four or five places or maybe more. And it had all kinds of different bands. It had local bands, and Double Axel, and we all know Double Axel are still going. They were always a popular band playing in all those bars and um, in all those different functions. And, and then it would get like sort of Grateful Dead and reggae bands from Vermont. Then we also used to get quite a few, you know, national touring bands that would come through. That was a, you know, I remember Santana came, that was a big deal, and uh, Peter Frampton. The surrounding communities were unified in such a way that their collective effort put the region on the global map. And so you start just doing those things and it begins a snowball. All the things that make a place homey and loving, and knowing you're, you're really a family. We've always had very strong alumni, of course. And uh, those things make a difference. Uh, when it comes to uh, collaborating with the communities around us. The university faced many challenges. However, through all the challenges in the school's history, it is the character of the Potsdam community to unite and achieve these goals. A number of distinctive elements emerged in Potsdam, which established a foundation for the future. This foundation was a combination of ideas with the energy and labor necessary to bring the ideas to fruition in tangible form. The ideas and results became part of Potsdam living tradition. The spirit of the people of Potsdam was an ingredient of primary importance. They were good people who were building the work and wanted to be better. And they made the school better and they made their teams better. I mean, I just think there's a real sense of family and community in so many small towns and, and this one in particular. Um, there are generations of alums, right, who's, whose children and grandchildren then attend the college. and. So I think that strong connection really adds to that sense of community and, and people feeling connected to the college for their entire lives. I remember I took a bus up, a Greyhound bus, and um, I loved it, absolutely loved it. It was everything that I was looking for in a college. It was a great place to, to make friends and to give an education. Dean Dan Hurley and Dr. Neil Johnson were two of the people who were especially instrumental in constructing a new path during the 1950s and 60s for Potsdam's future success. Don asked me if I would be interested in coming over and becoming an assistant dean. And I said yes. And so I was an associate assistant dean for a few years and dean of students went on until I retired in 1990. Well, I was just getting out of the service and I, I got a phone call from Sam Molinar. He had seen my credentials and asked me if I would be interested in applying. And I did. Oh, well, that was 62, summer of 1962. Early in his career, Coach Johnson had the opportunity of working alongside Potsdam's basketball coach at the time. Well, well, Luke McGrain was a outstanding. He gave me some hints on how to get started and to get going. He was a high academic person. He's the one that made us get interested in going back to school, too. But one of the things he taught me, and I tried to pass it on, is don't just be a coach. you got to get out and be known on campus doing other things, too. And that's the way you really got ahead at Potsdam. And that's the advice that Luther Grand gave me. I'm from Utica, New York, and that's part of why I wound up at Potsdam. Uh, the coach at the time was Lou Grand, and he was from Whitesboro, just outside Utica and he did uh, quite a bit of recruiting in the Utica area. I had kind of a unique window into activities over there because my dad worked in the public relations office. And I remember him talking about uh, Mr. Lou Legrand, um, who had been uh, running the basketball program, really thought he had accomplished a great deal with what he had to work with. You know, I can imagine when you're trying to recruit people, a lot of times athletes are drawn to the facilities he had to recruit people to, to Old Merritt Hall, which just had, I don't know, maybe four or five levels of bleachers on, on each side or something. So it was very, very small, but he was a wonderful man that I had the pleasure to get to know. Coach LeGrand was an excellent motivator. Uh, <laughs> he, could, he could do it in many positive ways, but he also was not above striking fear in the hearts of his players to, uh, let's say, to play to their fullest of their ability. 
And uh, that's one thing that stood out uh, with the coach. He was also um, a very intelligent man, and his um, intellectual approach to the game and the way he explained it to his players, um, I think was outstanding. Coach LeBrand was also a mentor to another up-and-coming coach at the time. My name is Jerry Welsh, and I was born in Chattanooga, New York in 1936, and uh, lived there for uh, several years. And I moved, we moved to Messina, New York, and we lived there uh, for, for several years. Messina is located about 30 minutes north of Potsdam and rests right along the St. Lawrence Seaway. Welsh graduated from Messina High School in 1954, finished his studies at Ithaca College in 1958, and went on to receive a master's degree from St. Lawrence University in 1964. In those early years before Jerry Welsh got into coaching basketball, he was involved in the construction of the Seaway. Actually, I think it's safe to say that there wouldn't be a St. Lawrence Seaway if Charlie Boots and Jerry Welch hadn't been there. They, uh, they're, uh, they're responsible for the construction of the Eisenhower Lock, I think, and the Iroquois Dam. I was very fortunate. The years that I was in college, 1954 through 58, was when the St. Lawrence Seaway and, and New York Power Project were at full force. So I was very fortunate to have a, position, a job in the summertime. Uh, actually, the first year I was in construction, I uh, was a laborer, and then I became a foreman. So in those four years, I was very fortunate to have a very good job in the summer to help me go through college. Then in 1959, at the age of 23, Welsh got his first coaching gig with his alma mater. Messina was expanding because of the Seaway. The high school, many more students were coming there, and they needed other coaches, of course, the varsity for the next nine years. Charlie Boots was my assistant coach at the Messina High School. He was a great athlete, one of the best football players ever come out of Messina, and an excellent basketball player. And he became a, an assistant coach in uh, basketball with me. Coach Howerhead uh, went to St. Bonaventure, and he was about three or four years younger than I was. And he came to Messina, I think it would be about 1963. Well, I'll tell you what, he was very organized from the get-go. I was his eighth grade coach when we started. We did the same things that the varsity did. I got hired and our friendship, I guess, took off from that point. And then a friend of his, I guess, for probably 55 years. Welsh coached at Messina High School for nine years, from 1959 to 1968. He quickly established himself as one of the area's best coaches. His teams won 146 of 178 games, which calculates to a winning percentage of 82%. At the time, Jerry was also thinking about going to Clatsdale, but I didn't want to wait, so there were two openings. There was an opening in Herman de Cal, and there was an opening in Camp. He had been the assistant coach under me, and then he got the opportunity to go to Canton High School as the head coach which was quite interesting. Jerry told me at the time, he said that's not a good place to go to because he said it's all hockey. I decided to go, believe it or not, we met in the championship game the next year. Unfortunately, he won. They also won several Northern League championships, including an undefeated season in 1965-66. That undefeated season proved to be a foreshadowing of things to come for coach Jerry Welsh and his career. In 1968, he began visiting Potsdam State regularly to meet with coach Legrand and to talk basketball strategy. Coach Legrand was having a successful run growing the Bears basketball program and leaving his mark at the college. Coach Legrand uh, was, was a very, very strong defensive coach and he 
was a good, op- very good offensive coach too, and he did a great job at Potsdam. He developed the program. He didn't fast break as much as we do today. You know, his teams were more ball control and things like that. And he did a fabulous job. He was also mentoring Coach Welsh while his own career goals started to shift away from athletics. The two would meet in the gym after the Bears had finished practice. When I first saw Coach Welch, he would he would be in uh, with Coach LeGrand after our practices uh, discussing basketball strategy. He used to make frequent trips over to Pasadena when he was coaching at Messina to uh, you know pick Coach LeGrand's brain and uh, you know to see drills he was he was running and everything. He wanted to stay up with basketball and do anything he could to. Uh, to, to be a better coach for, for his team at Messina and to improve himself as a coach. You have to keep learning. And as this coach Wooden used to say, when you're through learning, you're through. And so I had to keep learning and learning and learning. Jerry's a, a really unique guy. He loved the teaching, the studying, and the, the improvements that were constantly happening in the game. Uh, very, very humble, outstanding coach very humble, was always looking for new things uh, while celebrating the old and giving credit to the person he was studying. I, I, I really admire him. Coach Welsh was taking as much as he could during those post-practice meetings. So when Coach Legrand earned a sabbatical in 1968, he had faith in the young coach to take over the program for the season ahead. He's getting his doctorate at the university, at Florida State University. So the first year I went over there, I was the head coach because he was gone. And then he came back. And when he came back, I was one year his assistant coach. Coach Grant came back for my senior year and Coach Walsh stayed on the staff as an assistant, uh, a very active assistant, I might add. And then he decided he didn't want to coach anymore. So I became the head coach. His approach to offense was different than Coach Grant's. It was, it was more open and more up-tempo, let's say. Um, I think there's there's got to be an adjustment when you go from high school to college. And uh, there were some times there when some of the players may have felt they were being treated a little more like high school players than college players. And Coach Welch, I think, adapted his coaching style as even that first year went on. And uh, by the end of the year, we were much improved and had a big upset win uh, over Swingles in first place at the time. And it gave everybody a, a pretty good feeling going into the next year, I think. I supervised him. Uh, as dean of students, I had athletics as one of my responsibilities, and Jerry reported to me. I came over to one of his practices, and I was startled. I don't think D-Day in World War II was any more organized than his practices were. He, he was something up, boom, 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 right down the line. And he was a, a, a good person to work with. He went his own way. Now, you know, I didn't have to ask him too many questions or I didn't have to give him too many orders, that was for sure. But when Jerry came, uh, things started happening. Welsh quickly embraced the Potsdam way. Both of us had the advantage. We were moved up. He was moved into athletic director and continued to coach. I was moved into directing this facility before it became chairman of the department. That way, the college saved two positions. And yet, I moved both of us up, and we were able to continue to be successful that way. In addition, the athletic department was seeing incredible growth and support from the college. This included the construction of Maxi Hall. The first three or four years we were in Merritt Hall. So Maxi Hall didn't come until, uh, I, I think the first year we played in Maxi was 1972-73. But then I remember my dad talking about Jerry Welsh coming into town and Maxi Hall was was being built and, and uh, there was this walk around to like look at the facilities and you know look at Merritt Hall, look at the new, new place and Jerry Welsh was just like adamant that we are gonna pack this place out, this new big giant place. And that had never happened in, like there was no facility that big in Potsdam. And it was kind of like bold and brash to say, you know, we're gonna pack this place out, but that really made an impression. One of the first times I met him was when I had started SUNY Potsdam as a student. 
And I remember going to him and saying, I'm working at the college radio station. I've been assigned as a news and sports director, and I want to broadcast some SUNY Potsdam basketball games. Jerry would have bent over backwards to make sure that happened. And even though the college station was small and it was pretty much on campus only, the equipment was still quite primitive. There was not the remote broadcast stuff that you have now or just flip an antenna and go to the internet or whatever. It was the first real serious efforts at broadcasting local sports and having somebody there broadcasting it was part of Jerry's philosophy of getting the word out. I was the first interview coach would give after every game. We certainly are pleased with, with the results. So I would go down to the floor and coach would immediately walk over after the game and I would interview him after every game. First, first interview that he gave was to the student radio station. And uh, he, every game, it was instantly the first thing Want to thank everybody, want to thank everybody back in Potsdam. Thanks for listening, you're so important to us. Before you would talk at all about the game, and it was every game, every time. Coach Welch was, as we mentioned, a great promoter of basketball in the North Country. And uh, as his teams uh, got established, got better and better, Maxine Hall was packed when, when the Bears played. But part of that was his outreach to the uh, North Country community. He could have been easily a politician. He never forgot names, he never forgot people or faces, and he knew everybody in the North Country. Moving out of Mary Hall and into Maxie Hall was significant. This is one of the best facilities in the Northeast, and at the time it was, it became known and called the Mecca of the North Country for basketball, and still is, because it is a big facility. It can handle three to 4,000 people. Of course, that's where uh, the section wanted to play in their playoff games, uh, especially the big games at the end. I think I was pretty fortunate that our teams had a, had a good record here. Certainly not all wins, there were some tough losses too, but it was, it was a great place to play. It, was, it could be a very unnerving place for players who played the first game here when it was a big crowd and, and playing at, at Maxi. I used to call it Maxi Fever, and that the kids should the players should not have maxi fever. It's going to take away from your game. But many of them did on their, their first appearance here. I got to think, if you were a high school player and went to some of those games at SUNY Potsdam, you'd leave thinking, I want to play there. That's the place I want to play. The atmosphere there was better than probably, better than 90% of the Division One programs back then. And so you'd go there, it was a Division One atmosphere in Potsdam, New York. Hello, I'm Jim Thacker with Irv Brown. Irv, we've been to the Final Four, you name it. No more excitement than we got right here. We've been here two days and these people are going wild. If anybody's having any more fun today in America, I don't know where it's at, it's right here. Don't forget, ESPN was just starting. Local communities, you know, on a Wednesday night, they weren't waiting, waiting home to see the Big East play. The Big East was probably just starting. They were, they were going to see Potsdam. I can't imagine what the Potsdam St. Lawrence games were like back then. I, I'm sure that they were every bit as good as the, the Syracuse Georgetown games or the Michigan Michigan State games. It really became a, a showpiece for SUNY Potsdam and was able uh, to attract a good quality of, of athlete that maybe SUNY Potsdam hadn't been able to attract earlier. His first few classes of athletes feature some incredible talent which served as the foundation for the success that was to come. The tandem of two players specifically kicked things into a new gear and many others started to follow. I was playing basketball at Watertown High and uh, Coach Waltz came to a scrimmage to watch me play. Uh, following that, called up a couple of times. Uh, I had talked to my high school coach. He was aware of Coach Welch and, and the work he was doing. Uh, surprisingly, my high school coach was a classmate of Lou Legrand's at Cortland and uh, said, well, you'll have a great time going to Potsdam, you know, and, and it'll be a good school for you to go to. They'll, they'll, help, they'll bring you along. So I was very happy to go. And then Jerry said, come on up. And I went to the campus, had two great visits on the campus. And certainly playing with Mike Dean for four years was a tremendous amount of fun. We had Mike Dean and Ted Bentz and a lot of great players. Ted Bentz was a great rebounder. Nobody had seen a passer as good as Mike Dean. Well, it was just kind of uh, on its way back up then, and there have been so many players in between that, but I remember seeing Mike Dean and uh, Ted Benz play at LeMoyne and, uh, and how good Mike Dean is. And some of the guys that I associate with play at Syracuse with Jimmy Lee and Mark Waddock and guys like that, and they played with Mike Dean and said how good he was. He had 23 assists in one game. 
You don't hear that very often. I can recall uh, as a sophomore going and seeing Mike Dean was playing at the time. He was one of Jerry's original bigger recruits, more known recruits, one of his first protégés. Mike Dean was just as intense a player as ever played at Potsdam. He had a complete game. He was very well conditioned, strong, intelligent. You wanted him to have the ball in his hand late in the game. Like Myrna, he was like having another coach on the floor. Every team needs a guy like a Mike Dean. There might have been guys on the floor who were better players than Mike, but there was nobody who had the uh, the whole picture of everything that it takes to be successful in a sport. Mike kind of stood apart in that respect. Well, I, I was recruited to play football out of high school, ironically, because I, I was about six foot one like I am now. I always thought that it was ironic that the basketball people that came to look at me thought I was too small and football guys didn't have any aversion to that at all. He could have been a football quarterback at Syracuse. They wanted him there, but he went like basketball better. And he was into it every day of his life. It was basketball. I wanted to be a basketball player. And unfortunately, just never uh, had a lot of people flirt with me, but no one offered me. And so I came down to Potsdam and Hobart College. And I really believe I wanted to go to Potsdam. Mike Dean actually went to Hobart for a year before he came to Potsdam. And uh, Jerry just stayed at him and stayed at him. And uh, Mike was not happy and transferred uh, from Hobart and back to Potsdam uh, with Jerry's uh, persistence, is how I will say it. It was Jerry Welsh. It was uh, his interest in me. He, he came into the house and he sat down to dinner with us. And, uh, and then we talked a lot about basketball. It just, it just didn't work out that I went there originally. But he did such a great job that there was no question once the situation evolved at Hobart that I was going to Boston from that point. But Jerry Welch was the reason why I went to Boston. He was a great competitor and very intelligent. Maybe the smartest player anybody could ever have. He saw everything. You know. One time the vice president was there and we're walking from the gym to the locker room. The vice president came up to me and said, Jay, Jerry, you're doing a great job of teaching him how to pass. I said, I didn't even have the heart to tell him. He was a great passer before I even met him. My dad being a coach, I, I think I had an affinity for understanding the game. And I, I think that's what bonded Coach Welsh and I. We both kind of wanted to be as perfect as we could be. So every drill, I tried to do it exactly what he wanted and exactly how he wanted it. And, uh, you know, our, our relationship just uh, burgeoned from there on. But they set the bar and, and they were very good. And then as we got there, things after my freshman year, they just, they just continued to grow. As the momentum started to build, the word spread quickly. He just set the network up and worked it and worked it and, and got kids that wanted to play at Potsdam and that represented Potsdam well, and eventually started getting some real good kids. And uh, we got better. I mean, I think he had a vision and knowing what he wanted to do and how, do, how are we going to win national championships at Potsdam? And it starts with getting players. And once you get those players, you're, you know, and then you can get them to buy you're going to win. So coming from the Mike Deans and the Ted Benson's, you know, some of those guys having great players there who, who, who started it. And now you have success breeds success. And then, you know, those players are going to continue to come and then he continued to get those players over all those years. From the 1976-77 season through 1980, the Bears played 108 games. They won 82 of them. They were ECAC champs in 1977, made three NCAA appearances, and reached the NCAA championship for the first time in program history in 1979. That year, the Bears went 24-7 and faced North Park University from Chicago and fell 66-62. You know, they, they were good. They were athletic. They were talented. They were all 6'9". <laughs> That's what I know about them. All of them were big, you know what I mean? And I was the center, you know what I mean? And, you know, they were all big. You know, you know the, the center was like 6'9", 6'10", who, who also played at the next level. I knew that we had the pieces in place to make a run for the national championship. And the first time we went, you know, you, you always have a doubt. Do we really belong here? Or can we really win this? 
and that's just a natural thing. But once we got into, into the first Final Four and we won the semifinal game, and we got in that championship game against North Park, and we came within seconds of winning that game, I knew we belonged, and so did Jerry, and I knew we were gonna get back there again. That roster featured two future Hall of Famers who were still early in their careers. It was just that it got us ready to come back and win it the next chance that we got, you know? I mean, if we're gonna see North Park again, that's all, you know, during the summer, that's what you think about. Then I remember when Eddie Jacob came along his freshman year, I had never seen ball handling like that, like his dribble between the feet thing. It looked like his, he wasn't like stretching his stride out. It looked like a short little stride and somehow that ball was going between his feet. Also great no look passes, good jump shot. Spoon now throwing it to Ed Jacob. Jacob is the leader of this ball club. Jacob dribbles that ball behind his back and through his legs as easily as anyone I've ever seen. He does it like you and I walk to the drinking fountain. <laughs> He pops from 15 and he finds the range. Eddie Jacob now, then for the bucket. I did know that, you know, Notre Dame Utica was somewhat of a feeder. I mean, I knew Bill Myrna, Charlie Ferguson. Um, actually, uh, there's a guy named Joe Topa who actually played for my dad in the CYO program that went to Potsdam. So I was a little bit familiar with those guys going there, but I honestly had never been before. Being in Utica at the time, Hamilton College was uh, a big time D3 program. I was kind of raised going to see Hamilton College and, and uh, you know, Hamilton was always ranked, you know, second or third in the country. And then their tournament that they qualified because it fit their academic timeline was the ECAC. You see the Bundy Scott Fieldhouse here on the campus of Hamilton College, which is the site for today's ECAC Upstate New York. Division three, New York championship. It'll be between the Hamilton Continentals and the second seeded Potsdam Bears, 21 and seven on the season. And all of a sudden, here's Hamilton and me growing up watching them, you know, be one of the more powerful Division three schools. Here's Potsdam, you know, coming and beating them in these ECAC tournaments. So kind of got on my radar. And then um, my best friend and and teammate at Notre Dame who was two years older than me was Dale Shackelford and Dale became a, a big time star at Syracuse. Dale Shackelford made Syracuse basketball history in the 1970s becoming the first freshman ever to start for the Orange. It was a struggle at first but then uh, you know from being here at Notre Dame uh, we had great coaching uh, with Jim Klein. He taught us uh, you know everything about the game and I was able to go in and play at center my freshman year. Jim Bayheim actually was the assistant coach at the time and their head coach was uh, Roy Danforth. Danforth expressed a little bit of interest in me while he was recruiting Dale as a sophomore and then as the next couple of years went by he had left and Jim Beheim became the head coach which you know obviously he still is at this point. The thing that Jerry did is he, he found the New York State players and really um, found the guys that were really almost really could have been Division One players and got them to Potsdam. You know, I'd go visit Dale in his dorm, there'd be Louis Orr there. Louis Orr played in the NBA, or Roosevelt Bowie. So I got exposed very early in my sophomore year in high school what a Division One culture was like. That kind of opened me up to look at other opportunities. Ironically, Coach K, that was his first few years at Army, he, he actually was recruiting. Yeah, I remember meeting Jerry when I was uh, the coach at Army in the 70s uh, because of the camps. Uh, five star and that and and I knew of him you know he uh, was a, an outstanding high school coach and then uh, a great division three coach uh, one of the best in the country in fact it was a national a national coach of the year as I got into my senior year of high school and, and the season I mean Jerry Jerry you know he'd finished practice drive in a snowstorm three hours, you know, for 30 minutes in my living room with my folks and, and drive back. And, and he did that on multiple occasions and just built up a, a feeling that he really wanted me to attend there. But that first recruiting trip, just, you know, I had something to compare a big time culture to in Division One, and, and that's what Jerry was building there. And he never forgot anybody. You know, Rich, uh, say hello to Uncle Moose, uh, say hi to Aunt Beatty, how's mom, how's dad, yeah. tell Uncle Red I said hi. I mean, he was an endless guy that just made uh, every connection more important than the last. And that's what made Potsdam so important is that, you know, once he met Ted, 
he also knew his parents. You know, yeah. once he met me, he knew my parents. And, yeah. and so it wasn't just recruiting you as a student athlete, it was recruiting your whole family. And then in, in terms of building the program, uh, Jerry also is, for one, a very likable person and hardworking, and other coaches appreciated that. And Jerry relied on a great network of his friends that were coaching. It would, hey, you ought to come down and look at this kid. You know, a guy, a friend of his calls up and says, hey, uh, I played last night, this this guy beat us. Maybe you should come down and look at him. You know, I think he can play a five stadium. I was recruited by Coach Welsh, who was a friend of my high school coach. The story was that uh, my high school coach was going up to a game in Montreal to the Olympics to see Mitch Kupchak play and um, couldn't find a hotel. And Stan Kellner was the coach. Stan had called me. We went up there and watched Mitch Kupchak play because Mitch played for him in high school before he went to North Carolina. Dean Smith was coaching. John Thompson was coaching. And Bill Guthridge were the coaches. We went to Plattsburgh to see him play an exhibition game first against Canada. And then we went to Montreal almost every day. He didn't miss a game in Montreal. After that was finished, uh, Stan gets home and says, uh, Coach, I want to pay you back. I got a player for you. And that's how I got to buy Stan. You know, a lot of kids around New York City or Staten Island, they're going way up north to school. It's a long ways from home. But when you see Maxie Hall and you see some of the things that were going on, and, and, and Coach had a way with, with people, with families, that uh, you wanted to play for him. So I think that it was uh, it was something that built and, uh, and snowballed and uh, turned to something pretty good. I know every time that he went to Long Island, he would have already called four, three or four guys that were Potsdam graduates that were coaching down there to get to get the scoop on what players he had to go see. He had a network. He he was he was LinkedIn before LinkedIn was even thought of. None of us had much in our budget, so it was not unusual for us to go to Long Island recruiting, upstate New York, someplace in New York's recruiting where the hotels were really expensive, and you'd have two or three head coaches sharing a room on the road. There was four of us one time in one hotel room, a Ramada Inn or something in Long Island. Four small college coaches. One's on a cot, not, another guy's are, you know, they're sleep. one's under the covers, one stays on top of the covers. <laughs> It was, it, we, we had a ball because we were, uh, that's the only way we could make it. And probably all recruiting the same guys. You're, you're taking me back now. I'm just smiling because, I mean, we just had to do it. We just, we, there was no other way to get through the, uh, the recruiting. You, you really didn't even have a recruiting budget sometimes. You just had to find a way to do it. A lot of us spending our own money. Like I said, Jerry was just a tireless recruiter. He was on the road constantly, watching games, watching kids, and, and his follow-up. I mean, you'd get letters, hey, saw you had 10 points last night. It made an impact. His tenacity paid off, and the Bears rosters began to feature some of the top talent from all parts of New York State. I uh, went to a junior college. I went to uh, Westchester Community College. And I was there for maybe a semester. And then my buddy, uh, Derek Rowland, told me, he said, uh, look, I said, Maurice, we need you up in Potsdam. So the following year, I transferred to Potsdam. Well, first of all, Maurice Mo Woods, they call him from Potsdam, gets it up and down the floor as well as anybody in Division Three. He's very quick. He's very unselfish. He's an excellent basketball player. A six-foot-three senior from Brentwood, New York, number 35, Maurice Woods. I was recruited by Rutgers University. But um, Derek came to my house and he was like, oh, we got a good program up at Potsdam. And, you know, we were going to the championship and, you know, we got a good coach and, you know, why don't you come up to Potsdam? And I was like, Potsdam, where is that at? You know, and he was telling me where it was at up north and whatnot. So we took the long bus ride, 12 hours or more. Uh, from Long Island all the way up to Potsdam. And when I got up here, as we was coming up, Derek and I, we was going back and forth. I was like, yo, man, you're garbage. You can't play. You know, I remember you in high school and all this. He was like, all right. He said, when we go to, to, to Potsdam, we're going to, you know, go back to the gym, you know. He said, we're not going to pull our bags down. We're going straight to the gym. So we went straight to the gym. To make a long story short, Derek beat me 11 to 3. <laughs> he was 
really good, I mean, fantastic player. And he told me that um, a lot of that came from dedication and hard work. And he told me that um, the coach there, which was Jerry Welsh, um, was a very good coach and, and that's what he, he, he was big on, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of dedication and doing things over and over. And then that's when Derek was telling Ed Jacob, oh, I got a point guard for you. And, uh, you know, we played a pickup game. It could get ugly here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we played a pickup game uh, in the gym, and I got to meet, you know, the point guard for uh, uh, Potsdam State back then, Ed Jacob. Can I, can I ask a question here? Uh, 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 could you, say, when, 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 you, when you say you got to meet him, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, um, I had to guard him, and he guarded me, and it was. Um, it was a show to see. <laughs> okay. 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 I had to let him know, you know, where I came from. I heard about the program through a friend of mine, which is Eddie Jacob, who attended Pottsdam. And I guess he was talking to Coach Jerry Welsh about me. And um, Coach came down and watched me play a few games. And I guess he was interested in me and I ended up at Pottsdam. In addition to strong recruiting classes, Welsh was able to surround himself with some incredible basketball minds. The pedigree of, of all of the coaches he had for him is kind of like, it's a big list of notable basketball people. Stan Cohen and Steve Kamak loyally served as his assistant coaches. Their unique personalities provided the perfect balance for the Potsdam State team. Cohen joined Welsh's staff in 1973. Any good coach has a good coaching staff with them, and Stan Cohen was there for many years, not by mistake. Yeah, I'm very close to Stan. Uh, Stan was a great coach for many, many years. He worked at our camp for many years. One of the nicest people ever, and uh, a great coach in his own right. You know, Stan Cohen was not only involved with the Pasta and Bears program, but he started his coaching career here at SUNY Canton, which we're very proud of. And as a matter of fact, we have the Stan Cohen Court here at SUNY Canton. But uh, he helped grow that legacy. And if you look at the assistant coaches throughout the years who coach with Jerry Welsh, they're among the best basketball coaches in North Country history. And certainly Stan Cohen's legacy uh, in the North Country uh, with basketball and beyond is really well documented and deserved. Well, I knew Stan when he, I was coaching Messina High School and he was coaching at Canton. He dropped coaching there. But he, then he decided he wanted to still stay in there. Well, they had hired a new coach, you know, and everything. So he came over and said, I'd like to stay in it. Would you need an assistant coach? I said, well, it depends who it is. And he says, well, it would be me. I said, of course. You got your shoes ready? <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, so he became assistant coach. And, and, and a very smart man. Very good man. And uh, so that's where he came with us. And he coached with us until I left and he coached with Coach Mitchell and so forth. He just loved basketball. I think the two of them um, together, you know, were a great uh, combination. My father was Stanley Cohen, who uh, coached at Potsdam as an assistant coach from 1973 to 2015. Uh, loved every minute of it, uh, had several opportunities to coach elsewhere, but he liked the kids at Potsdam. He always commented that he just liked the kids that came here. I think he loved being that assistant that could not have the pressure of maybe being, you know, making those final decisions about what to do, but working with the players, and that was his favorite thing, getting to know the players for four years. And, you know, just that, that interaction he enjoyed, you know, even up, you know, until his last game, he, he, he loved it. Stan would always give you one of these, you know, no matter what it was, he ain't gonna be too hard, he ain't gonna be too soft. So coach, what do you think? And that's Stan, but no, Stan was, a, you know, had a great knowledge of the game. Him, Coach Walsh, and Steve came out. It was just a nice trio. They all kind of complimented each other. Coach Cohen was, a, to me, was one of the, the, the nicest people, but also, a very, and people don't understand that his, his coaching record at Canton speaks for itself. But as an assistant, he was very good to reiterate, and he was very, very subtle with you. It was like he would stand on the sidelines and sometimes just say, go to the boards, so that we would just get in our heads and go to the offensive backboards. Um, but he was a guy you could talk to no matter what the situation was, but he was a, 
a, a great uh, good cop, bad cop kind of thing with, with Coach Welsh. Stan Cohen was a very soft-spoken person. He never got loud, he never got, his voice never reached, you know, a high pitch. Everything was very calm, you know, with him, and uh, he also gave us good advice. For my grandpa, you know, everybody's gonna be an X and O's person, but the biggest thing for him was the relationships he made with players or players' families, and that's kind of something I instill in my own program today, is that when I'm recruiting kids, I want them to know that they're gonna come to Potsdam, but they're gonna be uh, a part of a family. It's not just gonna be, you're here for four years and then see ya, you know, it's gonna be relationships that you uh, make for life. Everybody was in sync with one another. Coach Cohen saved me so many times. I love him. Oh. I'm going to say, Coach Cohen, Coach Mitch, and every coach at Boston, they did everything. I mean, they put everything they had into everything we did. And um, I've never seen anything like that since or before. I love basketball. and. I always had, a, for some reason, a desire to coach basketball. I would go to the college and watch the Potsdam Bears practice all the time up in a press box. Day after day, taking notes, taking notes. And I'd see Jerry Welch every once in a while look up that way and wonder, who is this guy sitting up there all the time taking notes? We saw this little small guy sitting up in the uh, press box every, every day at practice. He's up there in the press box. Finally, I said to Frank Romano, who's that little guy up there? He says, his name is Steve Kamak. He said, he wants to learn basketball. He wants to coach someday. I said, well, for God's sakes, get him down here. He looked at me and beckoned me to come down and, and talk to him. So I went down unsure of what was going on. I thought he was going to tell me I had to leave. I was spending too much time in the press box. But he asked me, why I was up there taking notes all the time. I said, I want to learn about the game. And I knew he was something special. The funny story is I was watching his out-of-bounds plays one day and, and and they all looked the same to me. And I, when he pulled me down, I said, the only problem I have is 99, 42, and 28, and 22, all those plays. They're different numbers, but they all seem the same to me. And he said, okay, then you can help me. He said, they are the same. It's the same play. We just have a, it's a double digit play. Any double digit number that we throw out, it's that play. And he smiled and, and there we start off then and we had a great run. At that time, we had a freshman team, JV team. They were right on the court next to us. So he'd watch us part of the practice and do, and he'd go help with the JVs, later to become a head JV coach. And, and then every year from then, he was with us. And every year got better. Coach was, was very intense. You know, and and he put that desire in you that you know you got to work hard to be successful, and uh, he built a great JV program and he helped out with the varsity, and it was a uh, it was his competitiveness and his desire to win I think that they carried over to the program. And being underneath the coach of Coach came back, it was a, a good experience because he would tell us how to get to the next level. You know what I mean? He was one that prepared us for the next level. You no, know, and my my father always did. Have, he took great pride in those guys that played on that JV team, like mm -hmm. these two guys. Yes, he did. Yes, he and did. then went to the varsity mm -hmm. level and mm -hmm. and played an important role. He definitely you know, that prepared. Was a, that was a source of pride yeah, for him. Yeah, yeah, he definitely prepared us for varsity. And then he would try to steal you back to go play against Canton ATC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah, he would. When he, yeah. Oh, you try to distract play Coach Wells. Yes, oh yeah. No, no. Yeah, no, Bo's no, an All-American. He wants you to go play in a JV game. Yeah. Right. Right. Just one time. Because <laughs> yeah. we got to be careful. We got to be. We would converse and practice all the time. And after games, there was a time we lost the game. He asked me why, what I thought were the reasons why we lost. I told him. Then the next game we had, for some reason, he said we're going to change things around. I'm going to have Coach Kmack sitting next to me in this game. And from that point on, I was always sitting next to his side. There were a string of really great coaches who came to Potsdam, who went on to become, uh, you know, nationally known. It's amazing now looking back, oh, you know, you had all these, obviously Rick Carlisle with coaching and Tim Welsh coaching, Jerry Welsh coaching, and, uh, and Kevin O'Neill from Shady Gay and being an NBA coach. So there was a lot of great talent from the, the North Country to be around. When he first started coaching his first year, what he wanted to do was get the Messina community involved in supporting the Bears. So at Christmas time, 
we had a tournament that was hosted at Messina High School. Stony Brook came to play and Raleigh Massimino, who went on to be uh, coach at Villanova and national champion in the late 80s, was coaching at Stony Brook. Well, there was only one high school in the North Country that had a 94-foot court, and it was Messina. And I don't know if Coach Massimino realized that they were going to Coach Welch's former court. And I remember him as being fairly lively on the bench. I was playing the game, but you could you could hear him being very active. And of course, uh, Coach Welch had, had all the teams come out in the gathering afterwards. We had no idea where Willie Massimino was going to wind up, but it wasn't that long after that tournament that he was at Villanova doing great things. By Jerry's second year at Potsdam as its full-time head coach, he started the Potsdam Bears basketball camp, which has since become one of the longest running camps in the country. In 2021, the camp reached its 50th year anniversary. Through the years, the impact it has had on upcoming young athletes as well as area coaches has been immeasurable. So I got to know all those those coaches, and we used to have things in, in that isn't as pro, uh, as prom, predominant right now, but we had coaching clinics in September where all the high school and all the college coaches, I'm talking to be a thousand coaches in one hotel at one convention center. And we got to know each other Ben, over clinics and a few beers afterwards. We had a wonderful time and everybody talked basketball. It was, it was really, I was a kid in a candy store and as a, a coach in my twenties, trying to learn more about the game. Section 10 has a long tradition. Coach Welch, of course, was part of that because his Messina teams were very good. As time went on, basketball up here was improved for a great deal by the Potsdam State Basketball Camp. The legacy of the camp, it's amazing that we can still continue it and it's still one of the long, longest running, you know, tenured uh, camps in the country. Uh, it's awesome because it's not just about basketball. You learn your basketball skills, but you're making new friends, friends from different parts of the country, friends from other countries like Canada. That was always fun. Sometimes we'd have a USA versus Canada all-star game. And, it, you know, you always left the end of the week saying, like, can't wait till next year. Coach Welsh was not just enhancing the culture of Potsdam basketball. He was affecting the entire region and helping communities to reach new heights. He wanted me to actually sent the message of academic achievement and academic seriousness all the way down to the the Pac-10 kids. I think that's what they called the, the kids who were, you know, second, third grade type of thing coming in. Uh, all the way up through, you know, the, the most senior uh, males and females on, in the camp. And it's that kind of enthusiasm, it's that kind of determination for excellence that Coach Welsh started and, and it continues, like I said, to this day. I'm very proud to be a member of, of that, that philosophy, to try to help be a member of a team that pushes that forward. There was a time when Coach Walsh was running three weeks of basketball camp and putting about 900 kids uh, through the camp in those three weeks. A lot of uh, very good Canadian players would come and players from the Plattsburgh area and the Frontier League and eventually from Syracuse area you know, also. Well, he had a tremendous impact in, to, throughout the country, not just in the state and in his division, but he was very well respected by all coaches and uh, did an incredible job. I don't think it can be overstated uh, just how great a coach he was. You know, we had player evaluations to do, and like he only gave us a few days to do them. But you wanted to be impressive, even in that regard. He had the ability to make himself small and build everybody else up, and in doing so, became a great leader, like like he is, like he still is. At Canton High School. We had a great high school coach, Coach Jerry Howerhan, and uh, we started in third grade, and he was kind of our coach all the way through high school. And Coach Howerhan always had us come over to the Potsdam camp. That was like a given. And you know, this place there would be 400 or 500 kids at camp. It was just packed. You know, and that was the place to go. And that, we met kids from all over. So that was just a great experience. Well, I think Jerry was the father. You know, a lot of I can use had a mentor. To us all, but he was so open to uh, share his ideas. When, when the new gym opened the Potsdam and the basketball camp, I mean, every summer he wanted to be there. He just wanted to give back what you know what people had given him. 
you know, the best thing about the camps was meeting the kids and the kids looking up to you. You know, I know that, you know, I was a kid once and I knew that, if, you know, to meet um, basketball players at that level, with, at that level of success, it's just, you know, it's a thrill, it's motivating, you know, so I always try to, uh, to motivate the kids and the youth and that's what I miss most about it. They would go out into the community as well and I'll never forget one of my most special moments in high school, I was on the basketball team, I won an award, Leroy Witherspoon comes to the um, awards banquet and presents me with a trophy. I still have the picture of me and my parents and Leroy Witherspoon. You could have marched in Magic Johnson or Larry Bird for that matter and it wouldn't have been much more exciting for me and the rest of the team. Like We were all like, there's Leroy Witherspoon, isn't this awesome? He is at our banquet. It was just like that and it's still fresh in my mind because it was such a big deal back then and that's the type of impact that these guys had that they were just such a special group i was just a hyperactive eight year old kid when i first showed up there and i'm sure i was driving some people crazy including coach welsh because his practices they are orchestrated mm -hmm. i mean they are orchestrated they are detailed he would tell me you know johnny hold the ball and I, I would, That's right. but I was right. eight or nine, so I could only do it for so long. So I'd start dribbling again. You know, now I understand it. I was driving a little crazy, but mm -hmm. he was such a skilled teacher. And he, he had this way of making everybody feel like they were an important part of the program. So he would call me over. Once I really annoyed him, he would call me over. And instead of really getting angry with me, he put his arm around me and he'd say, uh, Johnny, you uh, big game against Albany this weekend. And uh, I need you to go see Mr. <laughs> Farrell in a training room and find out exactly how many rolls of tape he has left. <laughs> so I, I would sprint to that training room as fast as I could, ask Mr. Farrell how many rolls of tape he had. He looked at me like I was crazy, but Coach got a respite from me for a little while. He didn't have to worry about me dribbling around. Um, that's just the beauty of who he was. You wanted to do your very best for the campers and for him. And I always remember in his uh, opening the uh, camp, and I never forgot it. And uh, he would say, the most important thing in basketball or in life was be a good person. And I always remember that, you know, and, and just be a good person and, and on the court, you know, arguing or yelling at the refs and just being a good person, helping people out, you know, that type of thing. So it always stuck with me. And I thought that was interesting from a, coming to a basketball camp and that's the first thing every time he would say. Rick Carlisle and Hal Cohen were a couple of high school players who were dominating the local basketball scene at the time. Hal was Stan's son. He had an incredible high school career. The only thing I, we didn't get from him was his son. <laughs> and that's rightfully so. He shot and made 598 consecutive free throws. Coach Arian had us um, shoot 25 foul shots and then you go home. If you got the 25 you, and you didn't miss, you continued to shoot. And so I made the 25th shot, so I kept shooting. And this was my senior year in high school. Coach Howerhan, we were, he and I were supposed to go to a game here at Potsdam, and he was going to drive me over to watch. He kept coming in the gym, and every, every time he came in, everybody said, shh. Made 100, I went to the gym. He made 150, I went back. He was at 200, I went back. He was at 250, so I thought to myself, when the heck is it going to stop? <laughs> An hour and a half later, 598 in a row. I think the most I made in a row at practice one time was like 90, so I'm still I'm still working on it. I came to school the next day, and our uh, principal was in the middle of the school and was taking names of everybody that was there, you know. Somebody wrote to the Guinness Book of World Records, and, uh, and they said, well, that was nice you did that, but... Uh, we didn't have a representative there, so we can't we can't accept it. But next time you think about doing it, uh, give us a call. Following his senior year at Canton Central High School, he played for four years at Syracuse University and earned his doctorate. Well, Hal is from there, and of course, one of the great shooters we've ever had, and uh, just uh, one of my first recruits, and uh, great, great shooter. He had the three-point line. Uh, you know, he would have had a, a couple hundred extra points, but. Uh, a great, great shooter, a great player for us. So my dad's freshman year uh, was Coach Beheim's first year. So he likes to joke that he was Coach Beheim's first recruit, but that's probably never been verified. Well, that has now been verified. I think he was our first. We were right on the verge of, uh, you know, I just kind of took over and he, he just well, he wanted to come here and it was a pretty easy sell. When I signed to go to Syracuse, it was uh, the, there was another coach there, Coach Roy Dampworth. He signed me, 
the new coach that comes in has to re-sign you. So I think our recruiting time frame was like five seconds. I got a call, I said, you still want to come to Syracuse? And I said, yeah, yeah, definitely. And he said, okay, quick. And uh, so that was that. So I guess I was the, from, from that standpoint, I was his first recruit. Both their parents, my grandfather and uh, Rick's dad, Preston, uh, big into basketball, big into hoops, and they were always playing, and they're always trying to find gyms where they can get in and shoot, and you know they'd have good battles in high school. And um, my dad went on to Syracuse, and Rick went on, you know, his his own path uh, and made a nice career for himself. The two of them would play pickup games against Ted Benz and Mike Dean. After these years, when I was in college, I would always come back home. Rick was around. His father would bring his. Rick up to St. Lawrence and my father would bring me up to St. Lawrence and play against the guys from Potsdam. I didn't see much difference between the players at Potsdam and the players at Syracuse University. And uh, so he had guys that were really Division I players playing at, at Potsdam and, you know, being able to play at the highest level. And uh, so he got great players and he did a great job coaching them. And uh, they had unparalleled success. Rick went from Lisbon High School to prep school at Worcester Academy and developed tremendously. Before, hopefully he sees this, before he went to prep school, I could score on him. I shouldn't say at will, but, but as soon as he came back, he was like a different person. He was like a man, you know, he was bigger, stronger, and I couldn't score on him after that. So I ended up saying, well, I'm just gonna be on his team now. I'll pass to him. He was a great shooter, a great player. He knew the game, and, and, we, and again, we learned a lot of that from playing with the college kids early on. From there, he played at the University of Maine from 1979 to 1981, then went on to start at the University of Virginia in the 1982-83 season. Rick Carlisle, he is a big, strong guard, good outside shot. That team featured Ralph Sampson and advanced to the Elite Eight before Michael Jordan's Tar Heels took them down. Number 23, a guard, 6'6", six, six, sophomore from Wilmington, North Carolina, Michael Jordan. A guard, number 34, 6'5", third yearman from Oxenburg, New York, Rick Carlisle. Carlisle was then drafted by the Boston Celtics in 1985, winning an NBA championship with them the following season. Rick Carlisle has come in the ball game, second year out of Virginia, a guard who's got a lot of smart. Carlisle on the wing, baseline, get on the two. Nice touch, nice touch. Oh, Rick Carlisle now is going to get the unenviable task of covering Michael Jordan. Oh, but he's certainly relishing the challenge of it. Boston down one. Six on the shot clock. Carlisle, three, not in a good position to do much. Throws up a friend. This Celtics roster went down as one of the greatest teams in NBA history. The front court featured the original big three in Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish. Following his five-year professional playing career, Carlisle has since gone on to coach for 33 seasons, the last 20 of which he has been a head coach. He won an NBA championship with the Dallas Mavericks in 2010-2011, taking down the Lakers and Thunder in the Western Conference before defeating the Miami Heat. The Mavericks have scaled the NBA playoff mountain and have planted their flag. They are for 2010-2011. For the first time in franchise history, the Dallas Mavericks have won the NBA championship. Welcome to the White House and congratulations to the world champion, Dallas Mavericks. It wouldn't have worked without an outstanding coach. Uh, and Coach Rick Carlisle won a title as a player uh, with Larry Bird in the 80s. Uh, has a title as a coach, and then he just informed me uh, that he had also won, uh, what was it, the Pantoons? <laughs> what were they called? The Patroons. Pat the Albany Patroons. The Albany Patroons. Many of you did not know that <laughs> Rick Carlisle had also won uh, one of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a minor league team. Now, as the head coach of the Indiana Pacers, Carlisle is on pace to become just the 14th coach in NBA history to win 900 games. We're looking forward to this. This is, you know, a new era. Uh, I think a, an official new era of, of Pacers basketball. 
I'm not worried about things like, you know, uh, the, you know, my personal record. That's not what this is about. You know, I, every job you've got to, you've got to come into it and you've got to find a way, um, to make it better. And my relationship with the Pacers goes back almost 25 years, you know, to 1997 when it came in with Larry, you know, that was, that was another situation where, you know, people thought that team was probably pretty much done. And, they went on a three-year run of, of conference finals in the finals, you know. So what we're doing here is we, we are, you know, we are resetting the culture, the spirit, and the attitude. The impact these athletes had on the area has continued to be of great importance. The North Country is far removed from the national stage. That completely changed as more and more big names in the local area began to step farther and farther down the path toward some national or college level that they hadn't before. It changed the complexion of things for other student athletes. For example, even football players, uh, Brian Leonard from Governor, because their predecessors such as Hal Cohen, Rick Carlisle, paved the road, set the groundwork for those to come after them Rick Carlisle and Hal Cohen and I are still close friends today. They were just a part of the culture there. Uh, you know, we used to play with those guys after the camp was over, you know, uh, and, and being around them and their work ethic and what they represented, you know, they were, they were, they were true to the game. I mean, they, they were dedicated and, and, and I'm sure that some of that rubbed off on me. When you think about North Country sports, there are particularly teams and particular teams and dynasties and coaches that you think of that are among the, the greatest and the best. And if you came from a different high school in the North Country and you're, you're going to compete in high school, once somebody transcends that and continues to move on and upward, we all kind of cheer for that person, right? We'll cheer from the, from, for the athlete or the coach from Lisbon to Harrisville to Tupper Lake to Ogdensburg, doesn't matter. Um, we'll compete in, in high school, uh, but then everybody's cheering for those teams to move on and those athletes and those coaches to move onward and upward. It's almost like a, uh, a testament to the rest of us. The, the important point about that is the tradition of excellence in, in basketball in the North Country and hockey and, 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 and cross country and track and lacrosse and many other sports is uh, is long and deep. You know, to see them, he's played so well in college. It's, it's just wonderful to see them be so good and represent Northern New York. Despite not landing these two local legends, the Bears were still on the rise. The team came back even hungrier in the fall of 1980. Both seniors, as we said in the Open, they played on the tournament team two years ago. They both started, and they finished second in the national tournament. So they have been here before. That gives them an added experience. Think about it. Our starting five had four All-Americans, right? Leroy, myself, Derek, and Moe. Derek and Eddie had reached the championship before and were experienced leaders. They helped to push the team to new heights under Coach Welsh's tactful guidance. Oh, such a well-coached team. We were watching them work out here today and reading the information about how Jerry controls his team. It's incredible the work he puts into the discipline of these guys, and boy, they, were, they execute too. That's what we're seeing out here. Franco with the drive, and he walked right through three players. This season started with incredible momentum, coming out of the gates at a 15-0 clip. Local rival St. Lawrence handed them their only loss of the regular season. The team won nine straight games heading into the playoffs at 24-1. The Bears earned a bid to the national tournament. In front of a packed Maxi Hall, they were able to advance to the semifinals in Rock Island, Illinois. Then, a two-point victory over Ursinus College earned Potsdam another shot at the championship. Saturday, March 21st, 1981. It's the Division III National Championship game here on ESPN. The host Augustana Vikings battling the Potsdam State Bears from upstate New York. It should be a wild one. Basketball fever is running high here in Rock Island, Illinois. 1981 was a very important year to us because it was our senior year for a lot of us. That whole core group all graduated in 1981 from SUNY Potsdam. So the national game in 1981 was a big deal. 
when we came into the Nationals game in uh, in March, uh, we went out to uh, Augustana, and it was a little bit overwhelming to go out there. It was just a different environment. Saturday, they were packed to the walls. I mean, it was just amazing how many people they had stuffed into that venue. Augustana had the good fortune, or so it seemed, of hosting the championship game on their home court. The visiting Bears were approximately 1,000 miles from home. Augustana has the home court advantage this evening. And John, they will be under a lot of pressure tonight with the home court advantage belonging to Augustana. It could be intense. The first thing people don't remember, I guess, it was the first championship college basketball game that ESPN ever did. We were playing on the other team's home court and 5,500 crazies and it was bad. There had to be fire codes back then, but I don't think they were falling in that championship game. You see the footage and people are literally hanging off the rafters. I mean, you could never have it now, right? They're hanging off the rafter, rafters. People are going nuts. I still know uh, quite a few folks that went to that game that love to talk about it. Derek came through, big Derek Rowland. He was hurt. And Mo and Scott Franco and Eddie Jacob played a great game. And, you know, of course, Spoon just came in and he, you know, that's where the legend began in that game. It was, it was something, man. I mean, being a freshman and never been there before. And I mean, a little nervous until the ball went up in the air. And after that, oh, was, you seen it? You see, it was a packed house, man. People was hanging from the rafters. So everything was just magnified um, at that weekend. And it was just an amazing feeling. We stepped on that court. Um, it was just the adrenaline was pumping like never before. There's Jerry Welsh. And there's some of the Potsdam State cheerleaders making the long journey from just a fast break away from Montreal, Canada, in upstate New York, down here for this one. We asked Jerry before the game how many fans Potsdam State would have here. He said 120, 22 hours, two bus loads, and here they are. That's dedication. That is a long haul. <laughs> so a bit of a unique family history. I had uh, three brothers who had muscular dystrophy and spent most of their lives in wheelchairs. And Jerry Welsh met them, I think, because we started coming to the games. And he noticed one of my brothers in particular who was a big basketball fan. And he would always come over and, and talk with him before the game. And oh, he just, he always made time to do that no matter what was going on. And then as I got older, I started coming to the games with him. And I think they took our family van um, so that Roland could attend and drove to uh, Rock Island, Illinois. And um, so they were at that game, which was, was amazing. Before the championship game, one of the head cheerleaders went to my brother Ed and said, you need to turn Roland around so he's facing this doorway. And all of the players came running out and um, you know went up to, to greet him before they went out and played a national championship game. Coach Welsh had also noticed that because there were cheerleaders for both teams, and then you know on one side of the court, and then the, the benches on the other side of the court. My brother didn't have any place where he could sit with the wheelchair that he could watch the game and actually arranged for my two brothers to sit at the scorer's table so they could watch the game from there. I think the team and so many community members took Jerry's lead as well. And so I can remember my brother telling me that after the championship game, they all went to a local restaurant and the entire restaurant gave my brother a standing ovation when he entered, like they knew how difficult that journey was for him to make, you know, in so many hours traveling there. And and so it was just really appreciated and they showed a lot of gratitude and, and love. Kevin, this is gonna be rock'em, sock'em, loud basketball, and all but 120 people are for Augustana. A big injury that we will tell you about for Potsdam State. Against her sinus the night before, Derek Rowland was spectacular, making 10 of 11 shots from the floor and scoring 27 points to lead the team. However, he injured his leg in the process. This problem lingered with the All-American heading into the championship game. Derek and I were banged up. Derek more so than me. You know, there was a chance Derek wasn't going to play. Um, he had a big, big time thigh, thigh bruise. And then the previous week I had um, uh, sprained my ankle. And, uh, you know, I was I was taped up pretty good. And but, but Derek had treatments, you know, all the way up, you know, to, to the opening tip off. Pete Farrell, our trainer, who was fantastic, stayed up pretty much the whole night getting him ready for the next day, next night, the championship. And he did. And he played in it. We never could have come close to winning without him. And Pete Farrell deserves a lot of credit for staying up most of the night, taking care of him, 
making the leg so he could play the rest. Rowland is playing with a severely injured hamstring in his right leg, and last night Johnny took a tumble in their semifinal victory and injured his left leg. He's an All-American player for Potsdam. He cannot afford to be out of the game for any point tonight. He's their only real big man, and he's only 6'5". From the corner, the first shot by Maxwell Artis misses that. Here comes Potsdam the other way now with Jacob. Jacob trying to lead the break in the corner. He goes to Witherspoon. He brings it back outside, and Postum sets up the offense for the alley-oop in the bucket! That's two All-American players for Division Three basketball. Do you think they're used to each other? Potsdam started strong and led by seven points in the first half. But Augustana rallied. Maxwell Artis had sparked that comeback for the Vikings. He drew a foul and found himself on the foul line with just five seconds to go. At that point, Jerry called the timeout and uh, our team took the timeout and Augustana was already cheering. Their mind, they'd won the game, the game was over, they got the championship, they were, it was over. I was on the bench and uh, Maxwell Artis made the first shot to go up by one and we called timeout and we rounded the, the players on the bench and all the, I could see the people in the background behind the bench saying, too bad Potsdam, go home, you know, and um, just, I was just devastated, you know. Things looked bleak for the Bears. Artists converted both free throws to give Augustana a two point lead. That tumultuous roar was suddenly silenced by Leroy Witherspoon's historic Hail Mary attempt. Witherspoon caught the inbounds pass and raced up the court amidst the chaos. Just how it is, you just gotta be a general on the floor. You gotta know exactly what's going on. It wasn't even designed for me. It was designed for us to pick me and Eddie Jacob to go pick for Eddie. Eddie supposed to got the ball, I rolled. After I picked, I picked and rolled. So he gave me the ball and I had to push it up, five seconds to push it up and I just let it go. And all I remember is how quiet it got. And everybody watched that ball go through the air, and the next thing you heard was whoosh. After crossing midcourt, he released a shot while he was heavily contested by two defenders. Witherspoon hit the 40-footer at the buzzer to tie the game and force an extra period. He hit it because we ran a play. We practice every day in practice. What to do with little time on the clock on the made or miss free throw, and we ran it to perfection. When we tied it up, it was over. Once we went in overtime, we already know what we had to do, man. You know, let's go. We got five minutes worth of hell. And guess what? We never lost in overtime. Across the floor from their bench, their fans are really creating a stir. There they are. Yeah. <laughs> Let's count 120. <laughs> I don't think you'd get many more than that. Well, I'll tell you, and everyone else in this arena, Augustana fans, are silent. And then Spoon came down and hit the shot at the buzzer, and I turned right around and I started pointing at those people in the stands. Um, saying a few nice words to them and uh, just could see their expression on their face like the air just went out of them and we were jumping around it well i'll just never forget uh, turning around and staring at those people they were so happy one second and then they're devastated the next overtime game Potsdam state providing plenty of dramatic heroics and wouldn't you know it a freshman leroy witherspoon and the big guy roland now has 23 points Make it 24 and it may be insurmountable now. Potsdam left nothing to be determined in overtime. Their sights had been set. It had been years in the making, but they finally captured the title they had been working for. Looks like it's gonna happen. Potsdam State doing the virtual impossible. Potsdam State has won the national championship 67 to 65 in overtime. We won and that final bell went off. Everybody cleared the stadiums, came down, and it was one big group huddle on the floor and everybody was jumping up and down together. I mean, can you imagine a hundred people jumping up and down together? Bears would be traveling back to the North Country triumphantly as the 1981 national champions. You know, we'd been up for probably 40 hours, you know, after that game. 
enjoying the win and then flying home and then we stayed up most of the night the next night. One thing sticks in my mind is when we flew back into Syracuse, we got off the plane and in the same terminal, uh, we ran into the Syracuse University basketball team that was actually on their way to New York, to the NIT. And here we are, you know, with the a national championship trophy, NCAA. And we had a little bit of bragging rights there walking through the uh, the airport. And then we got on a, you know, the, the trip back up by 81 to Watertown. And once we hit Canton, there was, you know, the police escort. Firemen and the police gave us a, or took our bus in town and, and everybody's lying in the streets and they're all waiting for us at Maxi and the reception was was just unbelievable, you know, seeing everybody there, like the whole college. It was a great celebration. I was a shy little freshman, but you know, you got off the bus and there's people everywhere and we marched into the union and everybody got up and talked and congratulated you and when we got on campus, the three dorms, it was Lehman, Bowman and I think Knowles, they spelled out the you know, the number sign. You know, in their lights, uh, number one, it was pretty cool stuff. It's great getting off the bus, you know, and meeting hundreds of people, meeting us at the college and coming out with the trophy. Remember Jerry Morabito, a backup guard, having the trophy coming off the bus and people just cheering us. And then it was my turn. I, all I can remember saying is we won. I was just, it was, it was magical. But the championship to win it all, ain't nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Basketball was now officially on the scene in the region. Hockey was still big, but... They just have to understand they have to share the wealth, too, you know? <laughs> you know, we here, too. <laughs> you just have to, have to share the wealth, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well said, Mo. Well said. That's right, you got to share the wealth. But really, it was, they were hockey towns, and, um, but only for Potsdam basketball that they come out, we had a special program with hoops to compete with all the hockey that went around there. You know, and we would hound our parents to drive us through snowstorms just to go to those games. That gymnasium was, was packed, like you couldn't find a seat, right, during those years. So it was very exciting and it was a really big deal for a small community to have a team um, go to the national championship, right, and then win it at, at that level. It, it wasn't a, a, an, an overnight success, it, it didn't happen like Last year they were terrible, and this year they were great, and everybody wanted to go. People started to go, then a few more started to go, then a few more started to go. The townspeople started flocking to games. People came from all the surrounding area. I'm certain that it made a big impact on future students who thought they might want to be Pakistan students or Pakistan athletes. I, I'm certain that that happened. There was generally a kind of euphoria, and people were reading the newspapers, and they were looking at sports reports on television. Black hair was on the map. Every place you went, people were talking about, are you going to the game on Saturday? Where are you going to sit at the game on Saturday? I'll meet you there Saturday. If you were a basketball fan, you wanted to be there so you could enjoy great basketball, but you also wanted to be there because you were among your, you were among your brethren. You were among your your, your, your people, the people who cared about the same things that you cared about. Oh, it was just, it was just phenomenal. Just, you know, after every first made basket by the Bears, the whole student section would grab a roll of, a fresh roll of freshly minted toilet paper and throw it onto the floor. And always Chuck Foster, who was a professor in the biology department, but he was also the PA announcer, would say something like, the, the referees have advised the scorer's table that if there are any such outbursts like that, it's going to cost the home team a timeout or whatever it is, you know. And the, the, the students were shouting and stuff like, so what? Who cares? And, or they'd say, you know, towards the middle of the second half, warm up the bus. Or they'd say, turn north, take a loss. Turn north, take a loss. And, you know, and sit down, dig. Now, three of my favorite words of all time having to do with the former, I think it was you Albany coach, Dick Sowers. We didn't want to go into the student body to shoot foul shots at the end of the game. We wanted to go away from them because it was so vicious in there to try and make foul shots in that crowd late in the game. That was crazy. My first game coming there, I was, I had goosebumps sitting in the locker room. Uh, the first game, the lights were shaking in the locker room. The fans were already in the gym. And, and they were making a whole lot of noise. So I had goosebumps my first game. So it was, it was real amazing how the fan base was up there. It was a basketball, basketball uh, heaven. Well, you already know what we got to do, man. You know, we come here to do one thing, show up and show out.
Leroy Weatherspoon had earned the nickname Spoon and helped to ignite the Maxi faithful in ways that had never been seen before. When he was at Potsdam, they got a little problem there in the dining hall. All the students were calling him Spoon, and they were all taking the spoons up one by one out of the dining hall and coming to the games, taking two spoons and cracking them together. Spoon, 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 spoon. <laughs> so they had to go to plastic spoons in the dining hall. <laughs> the kids that came in, some of the fans came in, and they were carrying garbage bags. Well, they come to find out, they went to the cafeteria and they emptied the cafeteria out with a bunch of spoons. And everybody in the stands, they were passing spoons to everybody in the, in the stands. And the game getting ready to start, and so they call out the start of five, and we all come out, and everybody got spoons in their hand. And I'm like, what's going on with this? What's going on with this? So I guess they was waiting for me to score. To see all those people screaming and yelling, and when Leroy Weatherspoon played, they bring spoons. First shot, pass him head, everybody throw the spoons out on the floor, the plastic spoons. And when I scored, the whole gymnasium was flooded with spoons on the basketball court. So now the referees, they they, they blow their whistle and they say, time out, you guys, we gotta go pick all these spoons up. That's when I knew I was, I was gonna be there for a while. It was a very energetic fan base that we had. They really cheered hard. And... It was a great atmosphere to, to, to coach in. The conclusion of the 1981 season saw the departure of six seniors, including Derek Rowland and Eddie Jacob. Both had earned All-American distinctions twice, so replacing them would be nearly impossible. Out of the gates, they dropped their first game of the season coming off the championship. Still, Coach Welsh's 1981-1982 Potsdam team had a strong regular season overall. After finishing the season 16-8, and eight, the reigning national champions earned an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament, quite possibly as the final selection to the field of competition. Nonetheless, the team still had a roster which had learned from its playoff experiences. They were very well coached and prepared for these big moments. Maurice Woods and Leroy Witherspoon led a magical and unexpected run that helped the team claw its way back to the national title game. Unfortunately, they ran into a strong Wabash team, which featured future NFL player and coach Pete Metzelars. He scored a career-high 45 points to lead the Little Giants to an 83-62 victory over Potsdam. Look out, 40. Oh, my goodness. What a way to go out. Metzelars set NCAA tournament and NCAA career scoring records. Senior Mo Woods earned All-American honors after averaging almost 15 points per game while shooting 72% from the field. He set an NCAA record that season by hitting 19 consecutive shots. Despite the departure of yet another All-American, the 1982-1983 Bears finished the season at 19-5. They claimed the Suniac Championship with ease, defeating their opponents by an impressive average of 29 points. The NCAA tournament provided much slimmer margins, however. Potsdam skimmed past Ithaca in the first round. Three overtimes ultimately decided the game by just two points. Witherspoon's magic touch returned as he hit the game-winning jumper with three seconds left. Nick Lambros and his Hartwick team were next up in the East Regional Finals. You, you didn't know what the hell you're going to play against. You, you, you had to prepare for so many things. He pressed full court. He, he pressed three quarters court. He pressed half court. He went back into a regular defense. He changed. And I, I kind of did the same things. I, I never wanted to let teams be comfortable. And he certainly wasn't comfortable, you know, playing against Potsdam. He had to prepare for so many gosh darn things. He did a good job getting got Division I transfers to come back to Potsdam. Listen, they were they were good players. And I had good teams. I mean, it was good battles. And uh, thank God I had good teams or they'd have killed us. But you really didn't have to go scout him on the road because prior to the game, he showed his whole offense. He ran through all his offense. 
prior to the game in his warm up, which was cool. You know, if I didn't, if I saw something while I watched him, I said, well, let me see this. But he, he wasn't hiding anything. He just, you know, stop us. This is what we're going to do. Stop us. Jerry Walsh was really good in special situations. He was organized, and I tried to do the same thing. He really helped New York State basketball. He did create something, I feel, in New York City. He set kind of a standard, a higher yeah. standard, you know, and you had to come up to it. If you didn't, you were going to get your butt beat. Potsdam managed a four-point victory to advance to the NCAA quarterfinals. They ran into a powerful Scranton team, which ultimately won the NCAA championship two games later. As a junior, Leroy Witherspoon was named first team All-American and NCAA Division III Player of the Year. Leroy Witherspoon was an All-American. They were at the NBA things over there and was in Chicago. And Jeff Van Gundy was there. He was in the NBA then and uh, coaching. And Michael Jordan, they were in the midst of the playoffs. He was playing, and some of the announcers said, did you ever see a game, uh, did you ever see a person dominate a game as Michael Jordan? Did you ever see a guy dominate a game like he did? And Jeff Gundy says, yes, I did, but you wouldn't know him. He said, who, who is it? He says, his name was Leroy Weatherspoon. He played for Boston. Impossible to guard him. He's so quick and fast and strong and skilled. Unguardable. During his senior year, Spoon continued to dominate. Potsdam finished with a 20 and five regular season record. However, their playoff success was short-lived. They finished their 1983 run in the regional final. It was the first time since 1978 that the Bears had not reached at least the NCAA quarterfinals. Leroy's stellar performance was recognized again in his senior season earning him first-team All-American, along with the NCAA Division III Player of the Year honors yet again. When I get on the court, I'm zoned in, man. I, I'm zoned in to win. I don't like, I, I just don't like losing, you know? When I was growing up, we go play at the park, and you see you on the court, but they still sitting on the sideline, and you got a long wait. So I'm, I'm not going to the park to sit on the sideline. So I want when I get on that court, I want to win. That's with anybody I play. And that's just how it is. I'm not your friend when you're on the court. I want to do one thing. I want to outplay you, and I want to win. Coach Welsh continued to aggressively recruit and refill his roster with talent from top to bottom. The team became a well-tuned machine. Because we were tight in school, and we remain tight. Brendan, Mitchell, Troy Turner, Tim Harris. Um, I speak to these guys all the time. Um, Gary Sparks. Uh, from the previous team. Um, we were close back then, and we hung around one another at the same time. He spread our wings with other other um, students, and we introduced ourselves to other folks, and we just had a great old time. It was great. I mean, it, it wasn't only on the court, but off the court, we had the same type of friendship. I mean, you very rarely seen one player without another. We were all either together, or most of us were together at the same location, so. We enjoyed each other's company, and that was the most important thing. We liked playing with each other, and we also could hang out with each other after the basketball or just when the season was over, we could all hang out and just have a good time. One of the guys that really helped me um, was a guy by the name of Tommy Conboy. So we go and play some pickup. We hadn't known or met anyone yet. And I just remember going in and playing, and, and we were just dunking, and we just thought we was everything um, until the first day of practice. <laughs> We get there and, and, and I knew something was different because all up until then, uh, we're in a gymnasium playing pickup, so on and so forth. Coach Walsh and uh, the other coaches would come by sometime and just look at us, didn't say much, um, smile. And then that first practice, I remember coach gave me this look, and a look that I had never, it wasn't a mean look, but it was a look that I had never seen. And um, I say, once practice started, I remember doing uh, the brick drill, um, sprints, and then I remember getting sick. One of the things that the alumni all talked about, the first question they asked me, like, do you guys do the brick drill? Um, and I didn't really know what it was, so I asked some people, and then I, I watched the documentary on the uh, Baltimore boys and, and saw it there. And so you know, I thought it'd be really cool for us to kind of build in a new tradition, but kind of honoring the old tradition. So we have, uh, 
we do do the brick drill, not to the intensity that I think Coach Walsh and those guys did it, but um, you know, it's more of a symbol of, of the past and the present, and each guy writes a little saying on their brick. Um, that when they graduate for their last practice, they take their brick and they put it in the locker room um, as part of continuing to lay that foundation of, of what we're about and how we kind of continue to grow the program. So you know, it's kind of a way for us to honor the past, but also you know, build our own new tradition for, for the present and future you know, Boston basketball players. Once you get in that week of preparation and you look at the coaches, um, starting with Coach Welsh and how hyped up he was. They put in the work before us and then we got there, we had to continue it. So my whole focus always has been on winning, regardless of where I was at. And that was my main focus is uh, making sure that we came out, did the best that we can do and win as many games as we can. During the 1984-85 season, I was in my senior year playing for my dad. We bounced back from our departure in the tournament the year before to have one of the strongest regular seasons since the 1981 championship run, finishing 23-2. We won four straight tournament games to advance to the NCAA championship yet again. North Park University met us there. And John Clark is working with us, a former college and professional coach. And John, when you take a look at North Park and certainly Potsdam, they have been here before. They know what it's like. Sam, individually, it doesn't mean an awful lot. Collectively, it's awesome because both are tested teams. The North Park Vikings, three consecutive national championships. On the other side of the ledger, Potsdam State, no stranger either. They own a national championship. They're currently ranked eight. Both clubs looked awesome last night, so the game ought to be dynamite. Certainly there is a dynamic duo as well, as Potsdam will match up very well. Well, you hit a key word, match up. Brendan Mitchell, 6'5", sophomore. Not really a sophomore athletically. He's 22 years old. He's a transfer out of North Carolina A&T. Awful lot of experience. The stud on their team, Roosevelt Pony Bullock. A very tight battle to the end. Saw the Vikings edge us by just one point at the final buzzer. He'll take it all away. Puts it down at the buzzer, but it's not enough. But it's 72, 71, North Park wins. It was the fourth time in seven years that the Bears had reached the final game of the tournament. But it also marked the start of something much larger than anyone could have ever imagined. After we had lost, um, our, our main focus was getting back and winning it this time. So it was, we were all focused. Everybody was on the same page from the day that we lost. Going into the 1985-1986 season, Coach Welsh already had a roster that featured an abundance of tournament experience. I'll be honest with you, it was nothing less than a national championship. Because I knew what we had. I knew that, that we had a Brendan Mitchell who was just one of the best D3 players ever. And then we had John Leonard, who's a 6'5 point guard. Like, and I'm just like, wow, oh, we should win every game. You know, because we had talent on that team. And then you got Roosevelt Bullock, who's, who knows coach system in and out. And then you got Tim Harris and Barry Stanton. And of course, we had great coaching, including we, Tim Welch was on, that, on our team. You know, and Tim would help us, you know, get the system down. Another young, talented coach came to Potsdam before the season started. Coach Bill Mitchell made his way from Michigan to serve as an assistant on Coach Welsh's staff. I mean, I came from the Big Ten and, you know, playing in some of those arenas. And towards the end of that summer, I got a phone call from Jerry Welsh, and he said he was impressed with my letter and he wanted to talk to me. So early that August, I drove to Potsdam from Ann Arbor. He offered me the job. I thought Potsdam would be the absolute best opportunity, and it absolutely was. They also added another talented freshman in Steve Babiars. I mean, going to Potsdam my first day, Coach Mitchell told me to go down to the uh, Maxie Hall. I went down there. I was pretty uh, overwhelmed uh, with the players that we had. Uh, as a young 17-year-old freshman going down there playing with uh, Pony Bullocks, Troy Turners, John Leonard's, uh, you know, Tommy Conboys, Brendan Mitchell's, uh, I, I went back to my room, uh, called my mom and said, I'm leaving. I, I said, there's no way I can make this team. So, you know, the experience, but the experience that, uh, you know, each and every one of those guys gave me, it was unbelievable. Steve Babier is an All-American player. Steve couldn't dribble with the left hand. Well, he came so right-handed. So I went and bought a, a working glove 
and put it on his right hand. He had to practice with it as a working glove on his right hand. So he had to use his left hand to develop dribbling with his left hand. Well, I think, you know, Coach Welsh just, uh, I think he put me in the right position to succeed. That's what he does. He, he, he makes you feel at home. The players who had tasted that one-point defeat in the championship the season before were out for a vengeance. This vengeance came in the form of an unbelievable win streak. Through their first eight contests, they were winning games by an average of nearly 35 points per game. The Bears were a freight train, chugging along powerfully and staying right on track. Their momentum never changed throughout the course of the entire season. We were marked men. We had a, a target on our back, and, and everywhere we went, we were everybody's biggest game. We felt that was normal. That was, that was normal to us because of the year before, most of the starters, 16, 17 minute mark in the second half, coach had us sitting over on the bench most of the time that year. So we didn't play very many minutes in the second half against a lot of teams. The players were simply amazing. I sat back and just watched these guys and learned from them. It, it, it was amazing. They were so, so good. Pony Bullock could have done anything he wanted any time of the day. You know, and it was just it was just a learning experience that I got my freshman year. I played my freshman year because of uh, them, because the uh, the scoring margin that we had. Uh, it was it was just a great experience with these guys. They're simply the best. It was very competitive. But one thing I was always amazed with how Coach Welsh uh, got across to the team. It is about us. It's not about yourself. And so you're trying to do what's best for the team. And so whatever it took for us to win, whether it was to uh, get a rebound or defend their best player and shut them down. Um, you know, to go in for two minutes and play your hardest. Um, you know, people understood their roles, and that's why what was best for the team was very important uh, for the program. From the players to the managers to the trainers, everybody was a part of it. And I think that was one of the reasons why you had great team success because you gave guys minutes. They felt part of it. You know, especially some of the games where you had blowouts, those guys played more. But I think for a lot of them, the, the, even the talented guys, it was about winning. I mean, the, you know, you left other places or he recruited guys to come there to, to win. And, you know, some of that, again, just managing all that and putting it together. But um, you know, for some of those guys that didn't play, it, I think, like I said, everybody bought into to wanting to win a championship. Notably, they beat annual rivals like St. Lawrence by 36 points, Clarkson by 55 points, Binghamton by 40, Brockport by 42, and Cortland by 30. They entered the postseason at 25-0. and 0. And again, it wasn't about points. It wasn't so much about what you did statistically. It was about playing with the team and, 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 and winning. Hotstam was such a, a prolific championship level team. He had established himself as, you know, if not the premier, one of the premier coaches yeah, I'm just thinking right now about Bill Scanlon at Union and Tom Murphy at Hamilton and Nick Lambros at Hartwick. I mean, they, these are icons. They're all Hall of Fame coaches in New York State and, and probably could be in, in Springfield as well. And here he is with, with he's the he's champion maybe at some years of all of them. Jerry Wells loved the game of basketball and he, he just Loved being in the game and coaching and being around players, and uh, that's what it takes. I mean, you have to have that dedication and determination in the game, and Jerry had that as as much as anybody that's ever coached anywhere. He was a teacher. You know, there a, a lot of people don't realize that coaches are teachers. He literally taught classes, but he taught the game as a class. And the best coaches do that. The best coaches want their practice and their game preparation to be the best class his players would have at that school. And that's who he, that's who he was his entire career. No better prepared, more disciplined uh, coach uh, than Jerry Welch. I mean, just not many better coaches in the history of, uh, of our game, really and uh, just tremendous success, tremendous success. Throughout the course of the season, they averaged a scoring margin of over 25 points per game. The first five games of the tournament were not much different. 
a title. I think we can go back, and I feel that, um, hey, if we get there, we're going to win it. Victories over Oswego and Buffalo State gave Potsdam the Suniac crown. NYU, Alfred, and Susquehanna were all victims in the NCAA tournament. Potsdam State was once again headed back to the championship. The Lemoyne Owen magicians out of Memphis, Tennessee would be their opponents. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, and this is it. This is the final game, the championship between the Potsdam State Bears and the Lemoyne Owen magicians. Potsdam comes in with an unblemished 31 and 0 record. Lemoyne Owen with 28 wins and two losses. I remember when they went to the finals out in the Grand Rapids, the game would be broadcast from the Cena station, I think, and I wouldn't really get it. So I got in my car and I started driving toward the Cena, and I ended up on some big hill. I don't know where I was, but at least I could get the basketball game. So I sat in my car and listened. And there's the there's the customary Potsdam celebration as they score the first point here in this final round game, the championship, and the streamers are on the court. Lemoyne had no answer to the play of Barry Stanton and Brendan Mitchell. At halftime, Potsdam led by 11. Tim Harris sank key free throws in crunch time to help the Bears escape with a 76-73 victory. It was the first time a Division III team successfully completed an undefeated season with an NCAA title. And I also believe it's a fitting touch to Jerry Welch's birthday, him winning his second championship in a matter of five seasons. Brendan Mitchell and Roosevelt Pony Bullock were both named first team All-Americans. The well-earned celebrations began for the Bears as they made their journey back home from Grand Rapids, Michigan. The athletic program at Potsdam was developed by Sam Molnar, where Sam was our leader and, and he was behind everything. And uh, I said when we, I talked to his wife afterwards, the second national championship, I said the only thing that disappoints me was that Sam and my dad couldn't have been alive to watch it. Chuck Kelly, he was the editor-in-chief of the Augensburg Journal Advance News. I knew him quite well. And he asked me, he called me up for a morning, we were leaving Grand Rapids to come home. He said, we're having the expo going on, this is the last day of it. Could you stop on your way with the team? I said, yes, of course, of course we will. I said, I'd like you to do one thing. Would you ask Mr. Dwyer to be there? He was my high school principal, later superintendent of schools at Augensburg, a great man, Jeff DeWire. And uh, so he did. And Mr. DeWire was there. This ability to make everybody, from the custodians in the, in the facility, to the president across campus, to the people from the local towns who showed up, he made everybody feel that they were important and part of our success. The celebrations continued when they arrived in the North Country. God, there was so many students there and fans, cars all over the place, because they announced on the radio what time we'd arrive and stuff. And believe it or not, cars and kids cheering for us. Yeah. Governor Mario Cuomo even visited the college to extend his congratulations. And now the coaching staff, first, Assistant Stan Cohen. Jimmy Sagona. And Bill Mitchell. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the head coach of the Potsdam College Bears, Jerry Welch. The president of Potsdam College, Humphrey Tonkin. Jerry Welsh, of course, was um, was himself um, so much a um, so much a feature of the place. Again, somebody who was just not like anybody else. You know what he did with those teams. He did it because there was talent, to be sure. But but he but he was also able to get things out of people 
that only the very best coaches can do. But I remember, I remember many conversations with um, with Jerry, particularly um, about the team, about what he was trying to do, about um, about about Potsdam, and um, and and was a huge admirer of his leadership and his leadership style, which was which was really very special. How could you not like Jerry Welch? That was sort of the starting point. Jerry remembered everything. Once you'd had your first conversation with Jerry, you didn't have your second conversation. You were already into your fifth or sixth. And that was a, um, that was a special talent which rubbed off on the students because the students loved him. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the Empire State, the Honorable Mario Cuomo. Governor, the Bears couldn't have brought home the Division Three trophy without the support of their Potsdam family. Team effort is the hallmark of the Bears. 14 players, four coaches, managers, statisticians, trainers and assistants all give 100% to the team. The victory in each of the 32 games this season belonged to everyone at Potsdam who calls himself or herself a Potsdam Bear. It's really a thrill to be with the greatest coach in the state and one of the best coaches in the country, I'm sure. Potsdam is indeed special in many, many ways. Smallest school in the system. It's the only school in the system, the controller tells me, that has heating bills in July. <laughs> For the fifth time in eight seasons, the North Country was represented by the Bears at the National Final Four, the most appearances by one school since the tournament began. Jerry and the coaches and the Potsdam Bears have taught all of us. We look to you as a model of excellence in the state. Potsdam's title, the second in the last five years, has prompted the description of the Bears as the team of the 80s. Now, therefore, I, Mario Cuomo, governor of the state of New York, do hereby proclaim March 25, 1986, as Potsdam Bears Day in the entire state of New York. Given under my hand. Read the P.S.? Yeah. P.S. Potsdam Bears basketball is NCAA Division Number 3, Division Woo! 3, Number 1. Woo! Oh. Potsdam Bears, yeah! Oh, yeah. Excuse Woo! The Bears would be coming back into the next season with many returning players. Brendan Mitchell continued to elevate his play and would dominate his senior year. This earned him first team All-American accolades for a second straight year and added the distinction of National Player of the Year to his list of awards. I mean, those are something that they gave to me personally, but without my teammates and coaches, I could have never achieved it. So they helped me get to where I was at. So it's actually, it was all of our work. Another 20 games passed and Potsdam was again entering the postseason with an unscathed record. In his three years of eligibility at Potsdam, the Bears had won 95 of the 100 games. This brought their total to 60 straight wins. They were 60 and 0 over the course of two seasons and they were the number one team in the country. Yet for some reason, they were forced to travel to Worcester to play Clark University. In today's current playoff format, you would not have the top seed playing on the road before the Final Four. Nonetheless, the Bears trekked to Western Massachusetts to face Clark University in the quarterfinal game on Clark's home court. As fate would have it, this is where the Bears' streak would end, 60 straight victories. John Wooden's UCLA teams had an 88-game win streak in the early 70s. San Francisco had a 60-game win streak in the 1950s. 
No other men's programs have come close to seeing this level of success on such a consistent basis. I know that when we, my second year, and we had our 60-game winning streak stopped, and we were in the office the next week, he was never down. He was never, but there was one day where he was upset, and I could tell. I said, what's wrong? And he thought he let the North country down, you know, he thought he let the people up here down because he knew how important it was to them. And, you know, losing is one thing, but to feel like you've let this entire part of New York state down, that's when I, I kind of registered how important all these people were to him. The core group of players during the streak graduated that season. Babiars continued to lead the team in scoring over his final two seasons, becoming their all-time leading scorer. But the 1986 season marked the last time they played for the national championship. Coach Welsh's teams were still winning. They went 93 and 22 in the years following the conclusion of the streak. 1991 provided the team with a unique opportunity. Although they were not in contention for the national tournament, they faced Hamilton College, who was ranked number one in the country and entered the ECAC tournament with a 26-0 record. We had practiced the day before. After practice, Coach Welsh found out one of his very best friends, Ray Holmes from Plattsburgh, passed away and might have gotten a call from his wife and very, very upset. But uh, they will meet today with a whole lot riding on the line. In the history of Division Three basketball, only one team thus far has gone through an entire season undefeated. That is the Bears of Potsdam. Back in 1986, they went 32-0. and Hamilton has the chance to do that today against the Potsdam Bears. They beat us. So Tom Murphy calls me to get his scouting report for his game against Jerry. And we went through the lineup of you know, how they could do, how they could do, blah, blah, blah. We were starting a backup point guard by the name of Billy Dundon. So, you know, Billy Dundon, who's still a very good friend of mine to this day, um, I think he was averaging four or five minutes a game. I think it was 1.8 or two points a game. And in our game, that kid had two points. I think, again, this is his first start for the year against the number one team in the nation. He said, thanks a lot compared his notes, and then he played Potsdam, and that kid who had two at 27. Dundon all the way! Oh, what a hoop! And we we beat Hamilton, I think, by four or five points. What the hell do you want me to do? I didn't know that. It's crazy. And even though that wasn't a national championship um, for Coach Welsh, uh, being able to go down to Hamilton College, beating the number one team in the country that was undefeated, the only other thing that could have beaten that moment was actually winning an, another national title for him. So I know Coach has two national championships, but um, that ECAC tournament win, I, I think, you know, you can ask Coach, but I, I think it, it's it's probably the third uh, greatest moment that he's had at, at Potsdam State. The Bears not only won the ECAC championship, but they defended their 1986 teammates claim as the only team in Division Three to complete an undefeated season. This was also the last time Coach Welsh was at the helm of the Potsdam State Bears. I remember in the last few minutes of the game, when we knew we were gonna win, he motioned his wife to come down and she actually stood next to him. He had his arm around her, um, his last game at Potsdam. But I know it was a special moment for Coach and his top assistant, his wife. Looking back, I think about Jerry worked very hard at Potsdam, so he devoted a lot of time over there. But I was very fortunate. I had a good family that gave me a lot of support. And his family was also good about, you know, with the children, because I we had three children and I was working and he was working. So it was a challenge for both of us, but it worked out. Following the season, he was offered and took the head job at Division I Iona College. That's the influence from the, from the top dog, from Jerry Welch himself. Jerry Welch does a terrific job, and his career has been, he's been so successful through, through his career, you knew he was going to get this team on track. I had been assisting at Syracuse University with Coach Beheim at the time. When my father took the job at Iona, I went with him to serve as his assistant coach. Come up here, please. Come up here, please. 
three two, we're out like this. You know, coach showed you all week. Okay, this pass here to this spot, they're coming in. They're trying to shoot that gap. You fake ball fake that at that guy, and we also got to dribble penetrate into that gap. We're doing a good job moving the ball around the zone. We're just passing it around. We're not catching it and trying to find the gaps in the defense. Since they're overplaying these gaps and they're pressuring out here, these slots are open. The dribble penetration. Now, Marvin penetrated once. The one time when we swing the basketball, Banish that time caught the guy out on it. He penetrated the gap right here, and he found the layup. Found the teammate for a layup. You're being very unselfish. I love your unselfishness. You're passing to the open man. You're making an extra pass. Beautiful. But we've got to dribble penetrate the gaps here or out here. If they're anticipating to steal this pass, we're here. Penetrate the gap, go back door, and swing. Now, where we'll get good penetrations is we swing the basketball. I also think, gentlemen, in that matchup, when we go down through... He was there from 1991 through 1995, and then I coached the team until 1998. This was the last coaching stop for Coach Jerry Welsh. He retired and moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. There, he began teaching classes at Duke and serving as a scout for the Milwaukee Bucks and Los Angeles Clippers in that area. Now, at age 86, he still teaches those coaching classes to this very day. He was a lifelong learner and teacher of the game of basketball. When somebody says they love something, they cannot love it more than Jerry loved basketball. And it didn't matter of the level, and it certainly didn't matter uh, if it was in the arena for a game. He loved the teaching, the studying, and in other words, he's always ready to help. Uh, when he was teaching here at Duke, he would come to our practices, and I would ask his opinion of a practice, or sometimes in watching a game, if I would see him, what did you think? And, you know, a number of our players took his class, and we wanted them to because they would learn an appreciation for the game, a lot of the nuances of the game, but also they would be, uh, they would be taught by somebody who loved the game. They would hear things and see things maybe in a deeper light, which love gets you there. Love gets you deeper. And uh, uh, Jerry was able to do that. I was an assistant coach on the 1980-81 and 81-82 Potsdam teams. But my story with Coach Welch actually begins in the fall of 1977. In September of that year, I started as a freshman at Oswego State. But just two weeks into my first semester, my father died. That started me off on a serious downward spiral, one that ended with me leaving Oswego partway through the spring semester. I was back home and for the next several months was completely lost, aimless. The only thing that I had uh, done during that time to help myself was to put in a transfer application to Potsdam. But even then, even right up until the morning of my scheduled transfer interview at Potsdam, I wasn't sure I was going to go. But I did, and it turned out to be one of the best decisions that I ever made. I got to Potsdam in the fall of 1978 and took Coach Welch's coaching class. And something about it sparked something in me. And after a few weeks of the class, I got up the nerve to ask Coach if I could help in any way with the basketball program. Fully expected him to say no, but you know Coach, he's a lot more of a yes person than a no person. He said yes, and so I started out uh, as a statistician for the basketball team and uh, working for him in his office as director of athletics, just running errands and doing whatever it is that he needed me to do. 
And that experience, his saying yes to those things, started to change me, change me for the better. I started to gain a sense of purpose again and started to regain my confidence. I went from being the statistician to uh, a couple of years later, coach asked me to become the assistant director of the summer basketball camp where I was in charge of supervising the overnight campers and making sure uh, everything went according to schedule uh, during the camp days. And then finally, upon graduation, he invited me to become part of the coaching staff. I still remember that day. I will, I'm sure, until the day I die, and it was one of the greatest days of my life. Now it is almost 40 years later, 40 years of an extremely rewarding professional life as a college and prep school coach and teacher and administrator and counselor and now uh, for the last uh, almost 20 years a minister and sports psychologist and I owe all of that to coach Welsh he literally changed my life and he didn't need to do that. I'm sure he didn't need to say yes when I asked him if I could help out with the basketball program all those years ago. I, I think he said yes not because he needed to, but because he knew I needed it. And that's who he is. For these 40 plus years he has been my coach my advisor, my teacher, my counselor, my mentor, my guide, and most importantly, my second father. And so considering all that, thank you really doesn't seem to cut it, but thank you is the best that I got. And so thank you, coach, and I love you. We began this fine journey attempting to capture the essence of what occurred. Consider some of the feats that were attained during Coach Welsh's coaching career. His high school and college teams won 75% of all of the games he coached. At Potsdam State, he maintained an unbelievable 79% winning percentage throughout his career. Coach's home record at Maxi Hall Gym was 254 and 13. We also can realize how appropriate it is that the State University of New York Potsdam basketball facility is named Jerry Welsh Gymnasium. It was a facility that bore witness to so much of this success. Since founding the Potsdam State basketball camps, thousands of young athletes and hundreds of coaches from all parts of the USA have learned more about basketball and about the Potsdam way. Jerry Welsh's efforts, successes, and life's journey have been and continue to be excellent, admirable, remarkable, impressive, and noteworthy. Or simply stated, they have been bodacious. It's really, really just an authentic time of basketball with all of us to, to coach our hearts out, um, to try and make our guys better on and off the court, and just embrace our journeys. I, I could tell stories forever. It's, a, it's another book, but it, it's been a, it's, it hasn't been a journey. It's really been a, a bit of a fairy tale about having great things happen to you with happy endings everywhere. That's how you become successful. If you get you become successful if you just give it your all. At least you can say, I gave it my all. No, you don't give up, you know, never show your weakness. And and I'm sure that uh, everybody that goes to Potsdam now and going forward, they, they see the banners and, and they want to be part of history. Thank you for taking part in our reflections on this era. Back to wonderful days in a small village in Northern New York. The Bodacious Bears will always remain an important part of the college's history, and Hall of Fame coach Jerry Welsh will forever remain at the very heart of this community. 
you know, um, just a lot of great memories, Coach. And, and you look great, man. And, and, I, and, I, yeah. you know, and I, you know, as you can see here, man, we all have great yeah. stories, great memories. And I'm sure, you know, you're, you're, you're the common denominator in all these life stories. So you are the yeah. man, Coach. Want to say? I that. appreciate you saying that. I appreciate all you guys that stay in touch. I appreciate uh, the, all the success that you've had <clears throat> since graduation. And most of all, most of all, appreciate being with you for, for all the time you were at Potsdam. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Coach. We love, love you. We love you, Coach. We all love you, Coach. We all sincerely thank you, Coach. But the relationships don't end either at the end of the game or when your career is over. You know, the relationships carry on.